Welcome to the Legends and Masters show, everyone. I'm your host, Tom Wheeler, and I am very, very excited to introduce our guest today. He is a master at special effects and creature creation. He's a director, writer, producer. He's, he's done it all. Uh, welcome, the legendary Steve Wang, everybody. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having Hello. me, Tom. <laughs> oh, you bet. Thank you so much for taking time to do this. Uh, this one's extra special, near dear to my heart, because you... You're very, uh, uh, I know it's a, it takes a team to do everything, but you're very responsible for a lot of things that not only me, but many people hold dear to their heart. So well, I'm thank very you. excited to have you on the thank show. You. Yeah, you yeah. bet. Um, again, I, I usually start to show off because uh, it's kind of hard not to with the elephant in the room. We have this crazy pandemic going on. Uh, I imagine you were probably in the middle of some projects <clears throat> uh, when this all went down. Uh, what have you been um, doing to, uh, as I like the word, to keep saying uh, during this period of time? Well, we actually were just getting ready to start a pretty big project. Uh, we're like two weeks away, and then the pandemic hit, and literally everything stopped. And then, and as time progressed, you know, more and more clients just started dropping out. And finally, I just kind of resolved the fact that this whole year we're just not doing anything as far as you know getting work. So what I've done instead is that you know I have a collectible company called Elite Creature Collectibles. And so we're still developing uh, more products, you know, for the company. So we're, I've been doing that on the side with my at my studio, uh, with a small crew. And then I'm also too making some original art pieces and stuff that I'm. Oh really? I'm selling to uh, high end collectors. Yeah, it's all kind of you know under the radar. Uh, it's not so much on social media because it's uh, catered to a very specific clientele. So you know I'm going through oh, different okay. different channels for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And I'll yeah. pop this up as some pictures as we go. Uh, and I, you know, that's the other great thing I, I love about doing this show is, you know, there's may, maybe the main thing I, I personally know of our guests, but things like this, I, I didn't know this even existed. I, I've seen your work though. Uh, can you, when did you start uh, this up? Uh, we started elite. I want to say it's six ish years ago, maybe almost seven. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was actually uh, a client of mine that used to buy my my high end artwork. Uh, he reached out to me just out of the blue and said, "Hey, you know, what did you think about starting your own collectible company?" And I was thought, "No, nah, it's too complicated because there's licensing things to deal with. Oh, okay. There's manu manufacturing." Uh, I had another friend that I used to make stuff for, a uh, friend George from Toynami, who asked me the same thing. And then so I thought, you know, what if I was to bring George in because this other guy is familiar with manufacturing and connections and all the stuff in China. And then, so ultimately uh, between myself, my friend, Jason was, was a client. And then George, we became, we formed this perfect team. Like I'll do the artwork. George will do all the licensing and, oh, cool. and then Jason will do all the manufacturing. And oh, then, so gosh. it all, it all worked out well. And then we've been in it almost seven years now and we're like just a bunch of monster geeks. Yeah. We just love <laughs> monsters. And we get to make this stuff, you know, it like ECC is not my main business or, or the main business of, of any of my partners. We all have our own businesses. So this is like a, a side hobby for us and it keeps us busy all year long as well. Um, so it's, it's worked out really well. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and yeah, I, if you guys get a chance, I'll have uh, links up at the end as well. Uh, definitely go check out. It's an unbelievable work. And uh, I mean, it's like pops right off the screen. It's like, <laughs> you have your, your, uh, your man cave or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> your collection um yeah. now i want to kind of go uh i guess back in time a little bit sort of like your origin story uh you were originally uh born in taiwan correct yes and in 1975 no i wasn't born no i wish i was born in oh, you wish no. it was i was born in the 60s <laughs> in the, <laughs> i'm a little Scott older Raven. a little older than i wanted to admit yeah <laughs> uh, but you came over to uh, the u.s around like when you're like nine years old something like yeah, that yeah in, in 75 i came um, and I was, yeah, I was nine and, uh, and it was, it was kind of crazy because when I was a kid growing up, I was always very artistic. I did a lot of drawings as a kid. Um, and, and then moving to the U S I came around Halloween time. And so, and for some reason, you know, as a kid, I always had an obsession with masks, but the masks that we had in Taiwan were like these flat cardboard printed things, you know, that okay. you put on, you poke the eyes out with the little holes and you wear yeah. rubber bands. Yeah. So they're terrible. Uh, when I came to the U.S., I saw my first full head latex mask with paint and hair and all that stuff, and it blew my mind. And I started collecting it since I was 10. And then about four years wow. in is when I decided, you know, I really need to know how to make these things. And that's when I started kind of teaching myself and started looking at oh, libraries for references and stuff. Yeah. 
Oh, and and you were kind of learning. Uh, man, I imagine like now it's like YouTube and the internet. Everything's on. Right? right. Yeah. It's amazing. Like, even, the, even the Stan Winston uh, school of you know you could do online uh, education and you, you even have uh, videos from there. Mm -hmm. So what, what were you doing to learn? Just like I don't. Um, I was doing pretty much the same things all my contemporaries were doing, which was going to the library and looking up books on theatrical makeups and wow. you know, yeah, it, it was there's so little information out there. And then on occasion, you know, after a movie, if a movie plays on TV and it ends a little early, there'll be 15, 20 minutes. So they'll throw in like a making of King Kong or making okay. of Exorcist. Yeah. And we'll just and then we, we watch that and try to take notes and like study. You know, there's no VCRs back then. VCRs didn't come out till probably when I was kind of uh, like halfway through high school or something. Oh, wow. So, okay. yeah. So you can even record stuff to, re to re rewind and watch until a little bit later. Um, and so we just try to study photos from famous monsters and see like, oh, what's that over there? And what's he doing over there? Not realizing that some of these guys, like my idol, Rick Baker and, and yeah. you know, like uh, Dick Smith and some of these guys are real bastards. <laughs> they'll, they'll pose, they'll, make, they'll do posing of pictures. And they'll do something completely wrong on purpose because they think it's funny. Not okay. realizing all these uh -huh. kids like around the, the rest of the country are studying these photos religiously, trying to figure oh, out man. what they're trying to do, you know. <laughs> Try cracking so, that code, guys. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so, that's, I'm yeah. glad you brought that because uh, you you not only uh, you know you know were learning by what they were doing, you know they're doing some tricks. Um, you actually got to work with them, correct? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, on on they're legends of their own right. Stan Winston, Rick Baker, Dick Smith. Yeah, the best. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, you know, I what well, your first job? I guess what would you say major job? um was invaders from mars correct yeah that was the first uh, when i first moved to la um i thought i would take a couple of weeks off first to kind of see the lay of the land and i would try to get into the business and my my roommate at the time the late matt rose uh he was already working at stan winston and so he called me up one day a week into my 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 you know two week stint and he said hey you know uh we need more people here why don't you come in for an interview so i went in i interviewed with alec gillis who is the owner of adi now uh, and yeah, and he hired me on the spot and then I got to kind of be part of the crew and do do a lot of the lab work kind of stuff. And then eventually uh, I got to do some painting on the creatures and then end up going on set, which was just an invaluable experience. Oh, yeah, I can only imagine, especially if you're yeah. around that kind of talent, but being on set. Yeah, that's got to be schooling of its own. right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's really hard work. I mean, what people don't realize, they think, you know, Hollywood's so glamorous. And it is when you're walking on the red carpet, but you know, 90% of the time you're you're on set, you're working long hours, you're getting to bed late, waking up early. You know, it's really gru grueling work. Um, but you know, when you get to see it on the big screen, it's it's always, you know, it's worth it. You know? Yeah, yeah, in, in the end. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put this up because it was another one of my favorites uh, growing up. Uh, and you got to work on uh, a, a little bit of everything with these guys, right? Yeah, I painted on these uh, the, the, these big guys here. Um, it, it was a big group effort of a lot of a lot of uh, people painting uh, on these creatures. So I got to do a bit of painting on them, which was really fun. You know. Actually, I think yeah. we got yeah. Yeah, there's me right there on set. Yeah. yeah. That's that's unbelievable. Yeah, the experience on set. I, I think not only you got to paint, but you got to paint multifaceted, right? Like lighting and camera uh, angle and everything. Uh, no, not really. That's that's the job of the director and the DP. So gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So we were our job was okay. you know we're we're part of the creature crew, uh, and so we just we show up on set with all the equipment, all the creatures, and our job is to get the actors in and out of the suits, and then yeah. at the end of the day we do all the repairs and maintenance on it, and start over again the next day, and it, and it, go on, it goes on for months. Wow. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. I know you, you. Everybody sees the finished product, but it's so much. You know, I actually took a uh, a mask making class. Uh, I'm in Illinois. Uh, uh, Anthony Kozar is his name. Oh yeah, I know Anthony. Yeah. He's yeah. very talented. Yeah, such a good guy. Um, yeah. Got to do a mask making class. I did a, a bust making class. I also did a airbrush. And I'm telling you, like the airbrush is so it's so amazing. Such an amazing uh, mm -hmm. tool. But like the patience, the study, and the craft that goes into it, it brought like a whole new level of uh, yeah, I knew it took time, but like the creativity that you as the artist put into it, put a whole new spin on that. Like I, I really got, you know, as I'm doing, I'm like thinking like predator and 
<laughs> the the time it takes the the attention to detail on that. It, what do you get influences from as far as that goes um, for painting specifically? Because you're renowned for many things, but uh, on the Predator specifically, you were really getting the painting done. Yeah, I get a lot of my inspirations from from nature, and uh, you know, one thing when I was doing Predator and Monster Squad, Gilman was that yeah. I had noticed that very few people were painting them. You know, like uh, aquatic creatures or insects, and oh. they weren't really painting them uh, the way that real they really looked in nature. You know, it's like when they whenever they did something that was more monstrous, they would go automatically to what we call uh, monster stew, which is like purples and you know and like reds and you know oh. very kind of like John Carpenter's the thing kind of paint job, gotcha. which you know which for that style of work was you know revolutionary and it was amazing. Yeah. Uh, but then people just kind of adapt that and start painting everything like that, which I thought was kind of odd. Um, and so I just thought, well, I need to kind of like remind people like, hey, you know, if you're using references of nature to do these certain type of creatures, why aren't you doing it for the aquatic, you know, and the insects and whatever. Yeah. And so I just uh, just took it upon myself uh, and just started kind of introducing that look. Um, and the, the big turning point of my career in convincing uh, somebody like Stan Winston, yeah. the style was um, a monster squad. Uh, I showed him a, a really horribly rendered uh, color pencil coloration of the Gilman paint job, and it was terrible. I I, I didn't spend any time on it. You know, I thought I, I was seeing something, but I didn't think that maybe he couldn't see what I was seeing because obviously my horrible drawing didn't help. And sh I showed it to Stan, and Stan looks at it for two seconds, and says, "Uh, no." Yeah. So I thought, "Wow, I really got I really got to convince him." You know that this the, there's a certain look it has to have. Yeah. And during that time, uh, there was a, a contest called the Screaming Mad George. Uh, monster ha Halloween party contest. Oh, okay, and that was a contest uh, for industry professionals uh, to be able to do their own uh, creatures, makeups, or whatnot, and put it in front of Rick Baker, Stan Winston, wow. Dick Smith, and Tom Berman to, to be judges. So during Monster Squad uh, at night, I was making my own creature. There was a creature, like a big hermit crab, uh, samurai warrior thing with a hermit crab face coming out. You oh, know. Cool. And so I thought this is a perfect opportunity. So in three weeks at night, I built this entire suit and uh, and I went to the contest. And then uh, and as luck would have it, I won first place in the monster suit category. Wow. And so and so when the contest was over and we're on stage, Stan comes up to me and he looks at the thing and he says, so this is how you want to paint the Gill Man? And I said, well, not this paint job, but yes, this, I, this approach. And Stan says, great. And so he just says, paint it however you want to paint it. Wow, and really? So yeah, and so that's what happened when I painted the Gilman, designed the Gilman paint job. Stan came in on Sunday, brought his wife. And he was so excited to see it, you know, and yeah. he 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 loved the idea. That there was a camouflage paint job, the way that you know nature would intend, and and Stan really embraced that so much so that on Predator, when I showed him the design for the Predator paint job, mm -hmm. he didn't even want to see it. Stan just literally told me that I don't need to see what you know, whatever you're gonna do, wow. it's gonna far exceed my expectations so just do whatever you want and i was yeah. like okay thank you you know and, and i did it and stan loved it and that's the paint job you saw in the movie that's unbelievable so, what's that yeah. feel like too you know a guy that you looked up it was a, it was amazing because you know you know i was only 20 years old at the time and okay. and and you know and, and i was only in the business for just a little bit over a year when i did predator and um wow. and, and having someone who you respect so much you know like like yeah. stan winston you know he was really my my mentor and having him trust me so much to just do what i want to do um was it was an amazing feeling because that kind of confidence really helped boost you to want, make you want to work harder and do the best you can oh for sure for <clears> sure <throat> yeah. and yeah I, I think other other guys yeah i remember uh, like uh hearing you talk that he was more of a mentor for you um mm -hmm. uh, and yeah it, to get that kind of you know hat nod go ahead Mm -hmm. that, that, that trust that's unbelievable i will pop a, a couple of pictures up for uh so the monster squad we're of course talking about the gill man and to me this is the best design i love the entire movie i love all the creatures wolfman everybody but this was they're very eye-catching to say the least yeah this was uh this was a dream come true i mean my favorite monster is the creature from the black lagoon so being right. being able to be involved in m making a new one uh was great you know and and the photo you saw there yeah. Those photos, those are the ones that I took on set. It was the oh, very yeah, first, sure. yeah, very first night that we that the Gill Man worked, and so it was a, it was a whole new technology. We had Matt Rose and I had designed the suit to be seamless, 
And we never done a suit before, let alone a seamless suit. So we really kind of worked hard to figure it all out, the whole process. And we went on set and glued them all in. It was the first time we saw it all together, that photo. So it all worked great. The seams all went away. And thank God it did because it was really nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you too, because, you know, a lot goes into what you guys saw. So, of course, you were seeing this. And, and this, but originally, we, we, you know, it starts with this. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how how heavy is that? It's got to be a, like the team alone to help with that. Uh, no, actually, what you're seeing there, the head, uh, like the head and body was blocked out at the same time, but we cut the head off. Uh, Matt Rose sculpted the head, and I sculpted the body by myself. Okay. Um, I spent three weeks on the body. I think Matt spent about a week on the head. And then the hands, Matt had sculpted the feet, I had sculpted it. But we had to kind of do it in backwards, had to do the hand and feet first, oh, okay. made molds, cast of it, and then graft those things onto the body cast so that we can do the overlapping appliances of the suit. Amazing. Yeah, so that was all part of the the, the, the thinking was like, okay, in order to do this, we need to do it in this sequence. Uh, it was all very risky because we'd never done And we're 20 years, 20 years <laughs> old, you know, a couple of kids. <laughs> Yeah. You know, fresh in the business and like, yeah, let's make a monster. <laughs> I even love the, the little nods they did in the movie. Like uh, when you see the Gilman fighting the police officers, he did the classic, like the head crush. And everything. I mean, it was, yeah, it was everything about that movie was very well uh, kept up. Uh, yeah. And the paint job, I mean, again, I'll show for the predator. I mean, unbelievable. Uh, and Anthony Kozar was even when he did the, the painting class. It, this is his prime example. It's like the perfect. I mean, I don't know. I mean, at the time, you're not thinking like, you know, you're doing a good job. You're not thinking like, hey, I'm going to do something that impacts people's lives. You know, you're thinking I'm just doing this. What does that feel like when you are done with that and then you see it not only on set, but on, on screen and, and like the final product? I mean, that sense of accomplishment has got to be great. Um, actually, the opposite happened. <laughs> oh, uh, really? Yeah. You know, we only had eight weeks to build the Predator. When I was doing it, you know, I, I was literally working three days uh, at a time without sleep. And so was Matt. And so we were hallucinating like crazy, you know, and we were oh, just in it, when you're that tired, um, you really don't think about anything other than just the end game. Now, remember on Predator, you know, like we, we we got the body suit ready, the heads ready for you and we put it there and we left for the weekend and we came in on the weekend and it was done. You got you painted it and everybody looked at it and was just like, whoa, look at this thing. They were just blown away. And literally I had a blank expression on my face. Oh, I don't even remember that, you know, it wow, was, it really? was yeah, just, it was, yeah, it was just like, it was like, I, yeah, I kind of remember painting it. I mean, I have pictures showing that I painted it, but yeah, you know, I, you're, you're just, yeah, yeah, you're literally just like, you know, it, it just blur by so fast. Um, so even on set when we were shooting it, I wasn't all that confident that we had done something good. You know, it was, it really? was okay. yeah, it was wow. kind of uh, iffy. I remember Matt and I I was constantly like really nervous, like, uh, is this going to look terrible? And Whatnot. And it wasn't until, uh, I guess, in July or something, uh, 87 or whenever the film came out, mm -hmm. um, we were invited to the cast and crew screening. Matt went. I couldn't go because uh, I was on set for Hell Comes to Frogtown. Oh, wow. Okay. And so when, the, when it was over, our, Matt had called me up and I said, hey, how did the screening go? And he says, oh, it went well. He's, I said, how did the creature look? You know, he says, you know what? It looks a little better than we, we remembered. Oh, awesome. And I wow. said, well, OK, well, that's good news. You know, and then and then I, I'm not quite sure when I saw the movie. I don't, I don't think I saw it that weekend. I, I think I eventually saw the film. But the reason I started going to see the movie was because my phone started ringing off the hook, oh. and I had all these job offers. People would just I think I got oh, like fif fifteen job offers in a month. People wanted wow. me to go work at their studio, and I thought something's up. I need to go, and then I realized, oh, it must be Predator. I just wanted to go see Predator. Yeah, and I realized, oh, okay, I guess he's kind of he's kind of you know different. You know, people haven't seen something like like that before and, yeah. and whatnot. so it really changed my career i mean it's it just you know my career I mean, my career got a lot easier after that in terms of finding work right i mean yeah. that, that as a reference alone is is amazing i i always like this picture here uh like cue, cue the rocky theme song right he's <laughs> 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 cranking it out to get it done yeah now, that was a that was a joke shot um <laughs> because we used to always make a uh, little little comments about how oh you're a sculpting stud or you're a painting stud you know <laughs> so i thought how funny would it be if i had if i was like you're lifting weights as i'm painting you know like the painting stud and so we didn't have any weights like uh, real dumbbells so you, if you look carefully that was just a cut off broomstick with a little weight on oh, there so yeah, i was trying to balance this weight while i'm painting with the picture 
And once the photo was done, Matt Rose walked by and my arm shifted and one of the weights fell and broke his toe. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, felt, I felt so bad. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's a nice behind the scenes. See, we love <laughs> stuff like that. A little, in this case, literally a footnote. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I, I, I just want to, uh, there's like two more pictures. The question uh, we also have, uh, you know, anybody watching, everybody that's watching right now, uh, you can type questions and comments and uh, we'll bring them up, but that's the purpose of the live show. But we also have people that have uh, emailed things in. And uh, one was, and this I think is, could be a, a applied to Gilman as well, but in particular, the predator, uh, you know, he, there was some work where they're in the water. Uh, you know, how's that, how does that affect maybe the paint job? I think that's the question was leading towards, you know, your thought process going into like, this is going to be wet and things like that. Well, I mean, visually, you know, the girl man was painted like a uh, very, uh, very uh, like a, a salamander, you know? And so it already had a very aquatic kind of feel to it. And I knew that, you know, we had coated the suit with this urethane gloss called SC89, which was very toxic, but it gave you a really nice glass finish and made it look wet. Um, oh, cool. So, so and they also protected the paint. So when we put all that stuff on and we stuck him in the water, I, I felt he looked very natural. Like he belonged in the water. Totally. Um, and so visually, I think it worked. It worked okay. Um, now, from a practical standpoint, you know, being in that warm, swampy water, it was it was a you know, big water tank kind of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, it really did have a bit of wear and tear on the suit because then we had to when we got him out, we had to dry off the suit every night. And then oh. repair any of the paints and regloss and do whatever because the suits to go through a bit of a wear and tear every day. Yeah. 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 And I imagine you, you got probably have like extras of, you know, whatever the hands. Um, yeah. Things. Usually we do. But on, on the Monster Squad, Gil, the Guild Man works so little um, that we only had one suit. But, you know, but here's the irony of it all. You know, like normally, you know, you make a suit and you want you ask production, hey, shoot all the hero shots, shoot all the stuff that you can, you know, see it while it's brand new. And then if you have anything like, you know, stunts, you have anything like going in the water, whatever, things that are going to cause a lot of wear and tear, do it later in production. Okay, it makes sense. Both the Gill Man and both the Predator, first day, went in the water. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and then we got this thing <laughs> hanging behind a giant dryer, drying all day, and I thought, man, <laughs> this is just how it's always going to be. It's just, it's like a, it's like a foreshadow of things to come in your career. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's amazing. Uh and what are your thoughts? And, you know, especially people nowadays, uh, they've taken fandom to an, like a next level. Like you see these like like <clears throat> costume contests and cosplay for Comic Cons, and you see these guys making their own Predator suits. Like, how's that feel to see that kind of like uh, you know carry on in that way? You know, it's it's a bit surreal um, because I don't think about this stuff all that much. Um, but you know, because I've been to conventions and I, I've met some of the guys from the Hunter's Lair. I think I met one of the founders okay. of the Hunter's Lair. Uh, he had a pretty amazing Predator costume. In fact, I told him when I saw it, I thought, you could put this in a movie. It looked just as good, wow. you know? Yeah, they, they're doing some incredible work. And um, and the thing that it takes me a little while to to kind of connect the dots and go, oh, my God, I was responsible for, or partly responsible anyway, for the, this whole culture of these Predators. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it, didn't, it doesn't occur to me until these guys come up to me and call me the creator. They're like, oh, here's wow. the creator. Yeah, they, it's almost kind of re weirdly religious, I guess. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hey, well. yeah. <laughs> and when they and then when they call me that, that's when I thought, oh yeah, okay, I guess I can see that, you know. But yeah, but it, it's weird. I never kind of put myself in that shoe before. Um, yeah. Until until you kind of put in in a, in a situation where you have to kind of think about it. But you know, but ultimately it's cool. You know, I always say it's better than being uh, being associated with something that's terrible. You know. Right. Yeah, there's <laughs> famous and infamous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, here's another great shot. Uh, I, I this is a before and after, really. Uh, so, Kevin Peter Hall, uh, an amazing uh, guy. I'll, I'll ask you what he's like in a second. But here's the after shot. Uh, man, it's such, such a. <laughs> I know it's you know, between those two shots. There's a lot of work. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. What was he like? Because I hear he's just like this, like humble giant. So to he speak. is. Kevin is such a wonderful human being. Um, I can't speak enough praise about him. He's just he's he's humble. He's super talented. Um, yeah. He he he's like one of the guys. No matter where he goes, he's one of the guys. He's very sensitive. He's very. Uh, he's always very aware of of people and their feelings and stuff. You know. So he he's wow. he just uh, just a good good hearted person. And so um, I, I met him on Harry and the Hendersons, actually, because I worked yeah. on that with Rick Baker's 
and he was one of the Harrys. Uh, actually, he became the main Harry actually in the in the oh, okay. in the film. Because originally, I think they hired like one or two other other ac actors to play Harry. Ultimately, Kevin just did like he did the whole movie. Um, and um, yeah, so so I met Kevin from there, and then when we got to work together on Predator again, that was really cool. Um, he's just like he's just like a friend. You know, I remember I think a few months after we were done with Predator. And I was working at another shop, making some stuff. And he just stopped by just to come visit me and just say, hey, how you doing? And yeah, just to hang out and stuff, you know? And so he just, it's just, it was just so, I don't know. I just always had a warm feeling around Kevin. He's just a great guy. That's amazing. Yeah. And meanwhile, yeah. he's, you know, I it contrast Predator to Harry from Harry and the Hendersons, which actually I was going to go into. Uh, this is another, I mean, it's like a, a hit list here, a greatest hit list here, I mean, for crying yeah. out loud. <laughs> you, amazing work and the the artwork you guys put into this i mean you see how much just human emotion is conveyed right. in that and i don't know like i remember like talking like talking with anthony you know he's talking about like the the ancient roman sculptures and stuff where like when they do a sculpture and maybe you know sc sc definitely school me on this all you like uh like they like they don't want it just to look good at from one angle like you can should be able to walk around this thing and mm -hmm. it's amazing where you go, and that's exactly uh, what your artwork is like uh, all around. So, what are your kind of thoughts as far as that goes, sculpting and? Well, um, well, first off, the uh, I just want I just want to say that Harry is actually Rick Baker's masterpiece. I mean, I was just right, one of right. one of the sculptors that came on to help with you know odds and ends sculptures, but that was really Rick's baby, and he designed and created that. Oh, yeah. And to me, it's still one of the most amazing creations ever you know and then kevin's performance on that is just is amazing every once okay. in a while i i would go back and watch that movie to re remind myself why i'm doing this because it's, it's so magical oh wow really yeah yeah and then um and then as far as your question as far as the the art is concerned yeah um you know it, that that is very true you know like when i you know it's it's one thing is like i know people who are very like 2d artists and they draw these amazing uh drawings but then they they don't quite see things in 3D. And I didn't really understand this okay. until when I watched them try to sculpt something. And some some of them just pick it up and they're, they just go and they're amazing. Other people who are amazing 2D artists just can't see things in 3D, which is very odd to me because I, I would imagine they could see it, yeah. yeah. Um, for me, you know, when I sculpt, I'm always rotating this thing, I'm always checking. You know, I always okay. find find the hero angle, what's going, what looks the best angle of this thing. And then the, to the best of my ability, I rotate it and look at it from every angle and try to just keep adjusting, keep adjusting until every angle wow. to me looks good. Um, it isn't always successful. There are just some designs that just will look good 80% yeah. of the times. And there's that 20% where you're just like, okay, let's never see it from this angle because yeah. <laughs> in, order to have, in order to have this look good and this look yeah. good, this has to suffer. You know, it, it does happen. Yeah, yeah it yeah. does happen. Here's a, a nice, awesome picture of Ken Peter Hall. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the and off it really I mean he really did a major job bringing everything to life. And it's team effort, of course. But um and what was it? Was that like um I think commonly is is that like yak hair that they used or um or you yeah. know oh yeah yeah they, they usually use a combination of yak and human uh hair. Okay. Yeah, sometimes if it's really fine, they'll use like uh Angora or they'll use you know different types of more finer hairs oh, okay. and stuff, yeah. But usually they they use they use real hair uh, for a lot of that because you can style it. Um, synthetics wow. don't don't quite respond as well uh, to styling. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it, it makes sense too. Um, now I, I want to go into this. I, I, the first one, you know, we got two to take on here. Uh, of course, uh, co co director, co creator uh, of the first Giver, uh, and main director and creator of the second one. And <clears throat> this this I mean for me put that character on the map. I remember specifically back when we used to have like Blockbuster and things like that. Not None of that exists now, right? Um, you know, I'm walking through as a you know, young kid and I'm, I'm like, what is this? It's unbelievable, the, the costume design. And of course, that turned me on to all the, the anime and the manga. Uh, it, it, it's amazing, uh, that, the whole setup. So I guess we could talk uh, uh, briefly on the Giver 1, but I really want to dive into Giver 2 uh, as the story, I, I find it incredible incredibly uh, well told and intriguing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, Giver One was a project that uh, my good friend Screaming Matt George, who was also yeah. the co-director, uh, he brought to my attention because uh, apparently um, his manager in Japan had called him and said, hey, you know, they're making a, a film adaptation of the Giver comics and do you want to do the effects for it? And George says, well, if I do the effects, I want to direct. 
And so somehow they managed to take the movie from the Japan side uh, and uh, bring it to the US for George to direct. Uh, but George wasn't confident on the action and all that kind of stuff. So he asked me if I wanted to second unit direct all the action. Um, at the time, I was shooting my first oh, okay. my first feature film, which was a Super 8 film called Kung Fu Rascals. I was shooting down this. Uh, oh, yes. yeah. And so I told George, I said, well, you know, I, I really don't want to direct second unit. I mean, I, I'm trying to be a director myself. Um, so he says, well, how about if you and I co-direct? And I thought, OK, well, that's that's more interesting because yeah. I really wanted to work in a larger format, like a 35 millimeter film and whatnot. So George and I joined forces uh, and then, uh, you know, we made the film there was a lot of things about there was a big tone shift in the during the writing process of the script because oh. uh, Nin ninja turtles had just come out it was a huge hit yeah yeah and so we were told by by the producers you know oh well we want to make something that's more light and pg-13 and uh, and the whole time i'm thinking did you guys read the comic book <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> like this is not a kid's you know a kid's movie i mean it should not be a kid's movie yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it was work for hire. We were told, well, you know, sh shut up or oh, get out. And so we made this film and it came out very goofy and, and it wasn't my favorite. You know, we had a lot of fun making creatures and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But unfortunately, it, it just came out totally very inconsistent. Sometimes it got really dark and serious and sometimes nice. it became a big comedy goof fest. So, so that was that. Like, you see like you and, and screaming and, and studio studio you see yeah yeah it, yeah it was a, it was a bit of a struggle if you can see it in the movie um and so that movie came out and i guess it did okay you know it, it kind of went straight to video and it was theatrical in japan and a few other countries and then uh i think a couple years later i got another call uh from scream at george and george says hey they just offered me to do guyver part two uh i don't want to do it because it's not my bag um and so do you want to do it and i said yeah i i, I do so I went and I called the I called the producer, uh, the financier actually, and, and I said, "Hey, can I make this film? You know, what 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 does it entail?" And they said, "Well, you get a quarter of the budget of the original Guyver, but you have complete autonomy oh, if you can okay. if you can make it work." And I thought, "What? I have less than a million dollars to make a Guyver too. Oh, <laughs> but man. but it, they say, "Yeah, all we want we want a cute girl in it, and we want one monster in it." Okay. And I, that's all, that was all their demand. And I thought, okay, I could deal with that. Play with that. So, so I went off with my writing partner, Nathan Long, and we wrote Guyver 2. And it was kind of like, for me, it was kind of like an apology letter to all the fans of the first <laughs> Guyver because, you know, there was nothing I could do with just with the first one. It was kind of like we were just stuck. We had to yeah. make this thing that wasn't faithful to the tone of the, the comic. Right. So this one, I wanted it to be faithful. So I went to Japan and I met with the creator, uh, Yoshiki Takaya. Yeah. I told him my story, what I wanted to do, pitch it to him. He really liked it. We had a couple of disagreements wow. about certain things, about the ending, uh, mm -hmm. and and which we couldn't figure out at the time. But then when I went back to make the movie, he, he just said, do do whatever, do the best you, whatever you think is right. So I went and did it. And then somehow near the end, I kind of figured it out. Like, oh, I know how to make it. So it makes sense. It works and also addresses the, the his concerns. So oh, I awesome. didn't. So I didn't tell him. I just did it. And so when he watched the movie, he was pleasantly surprised. Like, oh, wow, you made it. Like, you know, I'm happy with this ending. So he was very happy about that. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I, I'm going to pop a picture up here because we have to. It's just so well done. It, I think the best, um, whether, you know, anime or comic to real life adaptation ever. Uh, hands Thank down. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Easily. easily. I, I know a lot of people say, uh, you know, Deadpool or, uh, you know, what was oh, Iron Man, which you had a part hand in that as well. Uh, but this is, it is breathtaking. It really uh, stuck out. And that, uh, he had a lot of athletic martial art movement he had to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how did you guys did you just factor that? Like, I don't know, like into the the joints or something is a little more fabric stretchy for him. Um, it was it was all foam latex. So he had an undersuit, you know, uh, of spandex inside the foam latex. So he kept it pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And we just put these, we, we put them in the suit, padded them up here and there, and they just went for it. We're flying them on wires. They do these incredible falls, things that would normally kill people. And they're yeah, trained, sure. they're trained to do these. Like when you see a horrible fall in one of my films, you know it was done at least twice, maybe three times. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, this is a Koichi Sakamoto and, and his alpha stunt team. 
and wow, they're okay. they're super trained uh, acrobats and, and martial art performers. Yeah, and so yeah, we just you know it was it was great. I will say to my defense, <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I had a hundred million dollars to make a Guyver movie, it would be a little different. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I mean, well, I don't know, like, um, like lack of money or maybe it's materials or whatever the case may could be you know possibly be i mean as an artist don't you, do you ever find uh you know when you're painting a corner so to speak it kind of you're kind of forced to be oh let me think outside the box and you're more creative than maybe you otherwise would have been oh sure all the time yeah 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 all the time in fact you know it's it's the old saying you know necessity is the mother of invention and that is yeah, yeah. That, that is how my films are made you know you, know, you look at a Marvel movie, you know, and they're what a hundred, two hundred, sometimes three hundred million dollars. Guyver Two was made for under a million dollars. It's, it's everything. I, we had thirteen creature suits in that in that movie, and we had we had CG effects. We had a shit ton of martial arts wire work, you know, awesome. a lot of locations. The movie was like you know two hours Stunning. long. Yeah, really? animatronics. That whole cave set we built that. That was that was built oh, wow. by myself, myself and my office crew. Really? And that was a that was a you know half the size of a football stadium. It was huge. It was oh, all man. built by my office crew and myself. So oh man, yeah, I, I love uh, you know the, the you telling that. What made you kind of go with the that story, the origin of the Guyver unit? You know, at, from that perspective, because it was amazing. Uh, you mean, you mean the uh, the finding the additional units? Yeah, the additional units, or like there was like some flashbacks and, and oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well. Well, I mean, I, to me, that was always the most fascinating aspect of the yeah. Guyver was yeah. that, you know, was that was that aliens had come down to create everything on this planet, including dinosaurs and whatnot. And, and so so people thought that, you know, that it was evolution that had created it. And in the Guyver universe, what happened was aliens created everything. Like we're all part of the alien creation. Right. Um, and so I thought I found that to be very fascinating. And then not only would they create everything, they were creating things in order to find to create the ultimate weapon you right. know these these aliens awesome. were bastards you know yeah. <laughs> they were assholes <laughs> at, yeah at the end of the day yeah 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 and then so and, and what was interesting was that guyver was a failed experiment and and uh yeah you know, that was they, such an intriguing point storytelling point and and that's the other great thing about this and i love about this is you know hearing about like how you came up loving this stuff and yes you got into um the art side of things but at some point, you know, you see like it evolved more and more where you, okay, I'm directing and writing this as well. I mean, what is that transition transition like for you? Or was it always something you were kind of revving up for? Um, well, before I, I got, I moved to LA, I, I started making Super 8 films uh, yeah. as well. And uh, the first film, after the first film that I had made was a 30 minute kind of, you know, cast of thousands, martial arts, monsters, total lunacy. Yeah. Um, I was bitten by the bug pretty hard. And so not only was I passionately into creatures and makeup effects now i'm also really into filmmaking so it was kind of the best of both worlds like i was i was equally passionate with both and so i, I could easily jump from one to the other the only thing i had to do was i just need a little bit of time to turn off one part of my brain and turn another part of my brain on which okay. is an interesting phenomenon yeah I, I find that if you don't use certain part of your brain it'll atrophy and there was a time where after I finished my last feature film, like 20 some years ago, and before I did my TV series, uh, Common Writer, yeah. um, I decided to turn that part of my brain off and focus on just makeup effects and sculpting and monster making uh, because there was so much I wanted to do still in that arena. And I just like, I got to focus on this, yeah. that I shut all that off. And then when I had the opportunity to start to start doing my own TV show, I was like, oh my God, how do you write again? And how do you do, you know, and I had oh, to yeah. turn that back on again and kind of get into it you know it was kind of it was interesting how that had to happen it's very interesting and and you know i remember uh you, you know i think you did an interview and you you said like like two of the things you loved like really loved growing up was ultraman yep. right and and common writer and and how you know poetic is that you got to direct i think you got direct up to like uh, like 16 episodes wrote like seven or something like that yeah no i was the i was one of the showrunners my brother and i yeah. were showrunners yeah on that yeah. on that project so Basically, I was in charge of everything creative from story wow. conception. I was the visual effects art director on that story writer. I might I brought Nathan Long back in again uh, to be my head story editor. Oh, cool. um, and then my you know, writer and then writers of my other films all got all came in and became staff writers. You know, it was like a nice reunion. I got to bring Mark Dacascos back, you know, who was in, you know, John Wick. Yeah. Yeah. And Drive and all stuff. So it's nice to you know, bring him back and Kathy Christopherson from Guyver 2. Yeah. brought her back you know gave her a recurring role in that 
um, so it was just it was just a fun fun situation, but uh, it was challenging because literally it was like, here's a big chunk of money. Now create the forty episodes of the show, um, you know, and yeah, and uh, it's a big, pro- it's a big, big project, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was it was um, challenging but exciting, really exciting, you know, because I, I love Common Rider as a kid. I got to meet the creator of Common Rider when I was twenty one. Yeah. Wow, really? And and yeah, and I remember when the Saban uh, Mass Rider came out. I know he wasn't very happy with that because they they turned into a very, very young kids show, you know, and Kamen Rider was always a darker kind of right. more, more grown up kind of show. Um, and so unfortunately he passed away years before I made my show. Cause I, I would have loved to have been able to present him with, you know, with our show and say, Hey, what do you yeah. think? You know, because it was, it was all done in his honor. Like, like I wanted to be faithful to, to the tone and to what, to what excited me as a kid watching his shows, you know, I think I think so. that's important, and it kind of rubs, uh, I guess, the fans the wrong way too. When yeah, when something has a, a certain tone or, or uh, aspect of the character or the story, and they just start altering all over the place. Which I mean, I understand you got to have your artistic liberties and all that, but you know, stay true to the source material yeah. uh, as possible. And, and and that you know, especially you know, through the Giver and the Common Writer. Uh, which, by the way, uh, speaking of like Ultraman and or kind of Common Writer category, were you ever a, a Spectre Man fan? Are you kidding me? I have a yeah. casting. I have a casting of a, an original Spectre Man helmet Get in my collection. Here. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, it was given to me by the by the editor of B Club, which was a, a Japanese uh, model kit magazine back in the eighties and nineties. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was. It's, it was. Uh, yeah, Spectre Man was one of my favorites. Spectre Man, oh, Ultraman. Yeah, Common Rider, uh, uh, Space Giants. Remember Space Giants? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Goldar, <laughs> Goldar, Silvar, and Gam. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> yeah, and then and another one that's not as widely known here called Kikaida. Uh, Kikaida. Another one of my favorites. Yeah. I want to go into this too because uh, I didn't. You know, I saw it on your uh, Instagram, um, but I, I didn't really see it like uh, Internet Movie Database or IMDb, uh, and that your w- work on Hellboy. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I, I'm not sure why I, that wasn't I on IMDb. They're usually pretty accurate with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, was there a reason? Maybe there's a reason for that, or uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really post much photos from from anything that I've done at Spectral Motion uh, because okay. I have I have my own studio now, you know, and so it's gotcha. kind of just out of respect for other studio owners. I sometimes I do post stuff from other studios because you know they're like my freelance days. But then if if you know, I try to do, to do that too much, just out of res- respect for other studios oh, because yeah. yeah, yeah. But as far as that DB though, I'm not quite sure why that, that wasn't should be on up there because I mean, guys, yeah. he's here with Guillermo del Toro himself, Doug yeah. Jones. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, uh, but, but another thing is Guillermo del Toro is number, not only is it a fun name to say, uh, it, it, the guy's imagination and, and ability uh, and style of telling story is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, what, what was it like working with him? He's a funny guy. He's a real funny guy. Yeah. And he's got a really pot, a real big potty mouth. Uh, <laughs> I saw him here. I heard. Yeah. The, uh, I'll tell you, my, the first day I met him, uh, it was when I came on Hellboy. I, I was just finishing up on Underworld. And then so I came on to, to Hellboy right after that. And Guillermo came in and he saw me painting that eight sapien um, uh, maquette. Okay. And the first thing he said to me, he said he, he reaches arms out and looking coming at me like a zombie like his eyes or he's like steve wang yeah. he's like i'm a big fan of yours you know and i was like oh, okay yeah. and then and the second thing he said to me was i ripped off your movie <laughs> he, he yeah he did drive oh, no, he did uh, uh blade two and yeah. there was a scene where where uh wesley snipes was fighting with these stunned batons with the vampires. Oh yeah. And that was in my film Drive, which he had seen and he was a fan of. Oh really? And so he that's the second thing he said to me was I ripped off your movie, you know. And I said, I said, Well, <laughs> thank you for being honest. That's very cool. Uh, you know, he had the money to do all the big visual effects for that, which I couldn't do on my film because we didn't have any money. Oh, you um, bastard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh Guillermo, yeah, Guillermo's he's amazing. He he's yeah. so gifted. He is so gifted. Um and uh he's very picky because he's a big monster fan. Yeah. And so, and so when he talks to you about monsters, he doesn't just talk design. He talks about where it comes from. He talks about like so. He talks about things that are sometimes very abstract. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah. When when I was painting the ape sapien head, mm-hmm. and in the forehead was kind of whitish. You know, 
Yeah. He came in one day with a producer. He says, Wang, can you make the head, uh, this part, whiter? Because, you know, the, the color white on, reads intelligence to me. Oh. And which to which I just replied, of course. More intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you so, doing? Doing intelligence. Yeah, yeah. He'll say stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you really just kind of like, Okay, not quite sure what you got that, but it's brilliant, and uh, I'll do it. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go with it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, the end pro uh, product was unbelievable. Uh, and again, and you know, also kudos to the amazing Doug Jones, a legend oh, yeah. in his own right. This guy's got to have just go to like Zen mode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's in the seat all the time, you know. So he is so <laughs> patient. I mean, you know, he's been doing it for decades now. Yeah, I remember first. I remember first hearing about Doug. Uh, one of my roommates at the time, back in the, uh, I guess, 87 or something like that, uh, worked on a McDonald's commercial, the, the Mac Tonight with the big moon face. Oh, that was yeah. Doug That was Doug Jones. No way. And, yeah. Oh, wow. And so that's the first time I heard of Doug way back then. So he was doing it back when I was a teenager, you know. And, <laughs> and, 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 and Doug's not much older than me. So, you know, it's like he was pretty young back then, too. He had an early start. Oh, that's unbelievable. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the guy's, you know, Anytime there's a creature of any kind, he's usually the person behind the suit. Yeah. Uh, he's a, he, yeah. I mean, Doug is a great actor, but he yeah. also is an amazing pantomime. And so when you, yeah. and, and what's really neat is like, you know, I've worked, I've worked with a lot of different creature performers, you know, I work with stunt people who are maybe quite, aren't quite trained to be creature performers. Okay. So, and then, then I work with extras that are just, hey, throw them in the costume. We need an extra body back there. Oh, and when yeah. you've worked with, when you, when you've worked with different, caliber of people in terms of their training as a, a as a, a creature performer and then you work with doug you know you yeah. you instantly just see a difference it's it's like working with um a, an acting student versus like a, an academy award winning wow. you know a, actor yeah it's like it's a huge difference you, you you feel it you see it right off the bat right off the bat yeah he, yeah. And he knows how to whatever he's got he knows how to work it to the character yeah. unbelievable yeah. Yeah. um Let's bounce around in, into this as well. Another uh, one of mine and many people's favorite franchises, and that's Underworld. You got to work uh, with Patrick. Um, yep. You know, like what if yeah, you did uh, some of the mask making here mm -hmm. and just seeing like the application of that uh, from Underworld, the first movie, Underworld uh, Evolution. Uh, man, what, what was it like doing that, that process? Because I know you're kind of – coming in for more the the face makeup on him or the, the prosthetics yeah i was i was patrick's uh, uh head art director on the underworld one and two uh, one, those yes. only only two that i really worked on uh, in the shop and so patrick would show me these designs and say you know this is kind of what i'm what i'm trying to do and i remember my first reaction when i saw the werewolf design was okay so you want a big hairless werewolf suit on stilts and whatever and i just thought are you crazy <laughs> <laughs> this is the hardest with, with these giant necks, you know. Yeah, it's, and, it's which is with, which will limit your movement, you know. And then you had to extend the head, and people had to see out of the, you know, the mouth, and it was just like all the all the classic like problematic things, like you try oh, okay. to you try to avoid, but it's hard to avoid sometimes because in order for something to look cooler, you have to do these things. Uh, unfortunately, um, yeah, yeah. And, and for Patrick, it's always aesthetics first, which you know it's hard to argue against because you know. It, Ultimately, what are we doing this for, right? We're trying to create an, an aesthetic that is exciting and new. That makes sense. Uh, so my job was to try to facilitate and and make what he wants work. Um, and so you know, we just we just went for it. And in in, in doing that, I had to come up with a lot of different uh, uh, techniques that were kind of new at the time. Wow. Okay. Um, because foam latex, the material itself, you know, it's 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 like mattress foam almost, but a little finer. Right. Right. And and you know it'll it'll buckle the way clothing will buckle you know and, and and whatnot and so when you have that much foam on somebody like the neck, if he turns his head it'll it'll cave in oh, and look kind of odd. Yeah. So which which allowed me to do a lot of things like I, I created the idea of uh, what I call Under Armour, which was creating harder pieces around certain muscle shapes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that whenever the suit would bend, it would only bend where you tell it to bend. So that oh, that's amazing. you know, like if you look at my shirt when I do this. You see all these lines going down my shoulder. Yeah, the same thing would happen with foam latex, but, but it wouldn't happen with our skin, and so it would look kind of odd. And so I created a hard piece underneath the foam 
that would end right on the line of where I wanted to buckle. So that when he went up, no matter how extreme it was, wow. this always stayed the same. It never buckled. Oh, that's genius. Um, wow. Yeah, so I started doing that uh, from suits. From that point on in the future, all, all my suits had Under Armour. Um, big neck things. I had, I had springs inside, uh, compression springs. Really? So that, yeah, like for instance, like this is a foam neck, right? And if you push it far enough, it'll bend a hard bend like this. Now, if you put springs on the underneath the surface, it'll always bend like this. It'll never have wow. like a hard bend. So I started incorporating springs into a lot of my suits as well. And then uh, I created this idea of using girdles with steel boning inside for the same idea so that it doesn't collapse. Yeah. And you can cinch the suit really tight to, to people's uh, waist because that's always the worst part of a suit. That tends oh, to look the worst. The most movement and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I designed this kind of this girdle. I, I work with different uh, various uh, fabricators, you know, costumers, to create this this new style of girdles that we would manufacture and put inside suits and stuff. Yeah, and and, and then a bunch of other stuff over the years uh, that you know, it's know technical. It's, it's, it's so crazy too. Yeah, I I don't know. Like embarking on this whole you know, journey, you're not, you know, in the beginning and as you go through, you're thinking, I, I just love doing this. And then, but you're creating like whole things that people are, Oh, that's, uh, we're going to do that now. You know, yeah. it's unbelievable. When you're, well, it, it was interesting on. because, because when I left uh, makeup effects to go direct movies, I, I left for about eight years, you know, to go direct movies. And then when I came back and I was watching all the people making suits still, and I, I noticed that they weren't doing anything, anything new. Like it was all the, all the same old techniques that was still happening back before I left. And so it had all the same problems, you know? And yeah. I thought, well, why hasn't anybody addressed this? It was kind of interesting to me. And so I thought, well, if no one's going to address it, I'm going to start addressing all these problems. And then I just made it, I just made it my, my mission from job to job. I will sneak it underneath. Like, I don't want to tell people I was doing this because they were, what, 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 we're paying you to do what, you know, yeah. I just do it. <laughs> just, just to experiment and keep, if it worked, it just kept going and kept going. Eventually just created an arsenal of techniques of stuff that goes right. underneath a suit that people would normally not see, but would make things work better. And I think that's a good point. You know, and, and uh, one thing I was emailed in, uh, and I'll bring up now is, um, you know, like, uh, you know, people that are wanting to get into uh, this, not, not even just as a business, but, you know, in this area, uh, you're kind of a, a tip, a major tip you can give them. I, I know you answered in, in at, at a, like a Stan Winston uh, interview once, uh, I was wondering if you can go kind of into that because I think that that sounds like it answers that very thoroughly. Is you know, how, I take the break into it and be professional and all that. Stuff. Um, I'm not quite sure what I said at Stan's thing because that was probably a long time ago. Uh, but you know, and, and also too, times times have changed quite a bit since since that interview. Um, okay. Because yeah, because there was a time where you know, if people asked me should I try to get into makeup effects, I would advise them not to. Yeah. Because there was there was a there was yeah. a good chunk of time where literally CG just took over everything. It really did. And, and yeah. work was very hard to find. And a lot of people left the business and shops was closing down. And you definitely didn't want to try to start getting into the makeup business at that point. Um, but I think that we've, we've we've kind of seen it all go a full circle now. Uh, you know, CG kind of I think found its place. And and yes, it's still being used for the majority of stuff. But a lot of practical uh, makeups and, and creatures are finding its way back again. Um, yeah. So, so the doors have kind of reopened. Um, I think even, I think makeup, uh, especially, has sort of reached a uh, an apex uh, in its in its place in the business. Because I think now more than ever, there's so much makeups being done on TV shows, movies, you know, prosthetics, and the makeups themselves now have, have become better. Over the years, they, they're, some of the makeups are so amazing and flawless. Now people are, are doing such wonderful work, you know. That if if person oh, wants to yeah. get in and, and become a makeup artist, I would say, yeah, I think you you know if you're talented, you're hardworking, uh, you have a good chance of getting in because you know that that part of the business is, I believe, is thriving quite quite well. Uh, creature effects, not as much. There's still work being done, but it it never came back to the degree that it was before it before CG kind of killed it. Uh, wow. But there's still, you know, there's still stuff being done here and there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, anybody wanting to get in, in the industry, I would advise them, like, you know, it's not going to be easy. You know, uh, make sure you have the right attitude, you know, positive attitude. Yeah. Uh, uh, good temperament, you know, uh, and uh, a sense of teamwork. But also, too, you, you have to be talented and you have to just want to work hard because it's not glamorous. It's hard work. I think yeah. that was that was the point you made in the, is the hard work and uh, yeah. You know, or for example, uh, you know, the way I like to work is like, 
all right, am I watching uh, this movie or binging this series or whatever, mm -hmm. or am I in the shop working on improving my sculpting skills, improving, uh, or like you mentioned with the Predator earlier, it's like, okay, people are doing the same monster uh, paint, paint jobs. This thing's more aquatic. This mm -hmm. that more. Uh, I think that, that that's worth its weight in gold, not just in, I, I would imagine, not just in doing art, but like in anything, like just you know go out there and, and put your time in a, on the craft mm -hmm. uh, and that makes that makes so much sense yeah i mean you know a sure way surefire way to get work is work on your art build a portfolio and and uh you know do the best work you can and then do try to do better uh you know there's really no sugar coating it you know it's 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 a business right yeah. if you want to work you got to be really good at it you know, and people who can't take criticism for the work or people who can't, uh, you know, who doesn't oh, feel I entitled see, yeah. and don't and, and think they're great, but they can't see the difference, you know, are going to have yeah. a harder time. Because you know, I remind people, like, you're competing with some of the best artists in the entire world, world yeah. you know, and, and this is not a joke. I mean, there are artists in this business that I work with, some of my contemporaries that are so fucking amazing yeah. that when I when I see their work, sometimes I go, fuck, how the <laughs> yeah. hell? They're, yeah. they're amazing you know you know like yeah. i don't feel i don't feel that i'm the best in the business it's like i'm very proficient at a bunch of things you know i have my own style which i think maybe gives me an advantage on certain type of things that i do yeah but then that's just one aspect of, of our of our craft there's just so much more to it and there are people uh there are artists like mitch devane you know kazuhiro you know there's so many of them uh, out there that are that are on a level that is so high that you know, I, I encourage people like if you want to be an artist in this business, and yeah, maybe you maybe you might not be as great as these guys. You don't have to be as great as they they are, you know. Okay. But if you're, but you have to be not far behind them if you want to be that guy, that girl, you know. I'm sorry, that woman yeah. that that uh, gets gets the the opportunities, you know. And if and if you come into if anybody comes to my studio with a portfolio that makes me go wow. I'm gonna hire that person, that you know. You know what sense. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, if you once you're hired, then I hope you have a good attitude. Uh, you don't have a big ego, you know, and all that kind of stuff because yeah. that that's a sure way to end your career quickly too. It's, it's that, if you're it's a difficult tough. person to work with, yeah. I would totally mad, yeah, because you're especially you guys are working together on on uh, you know at the shop or on set or whatever. I, you don't want to be butting heads over ego. It's not gonna yeah. go very far. Yeah, if you're uh, talented and easy to work with, you'll have a career. I mean, you'll be, you know, it's 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 such a simple formula. So interesting. And, and yeah. for you, like, uh, what was your kind of like your your coming up when you're learning your craft, so to speak? You're kind of uh, learning from different uh, books and things like you know from the library or or the little behind the scenes that you could get a hold of. Did you also spend a lot of time on just like let's say it's sculpting and just like learning the anatomy? You know, all the learn anatomy, learn the classics, uh, things like that as well? Um, I, I personally didn't um, because, I, and the reason is because I'm a, I'm a monster maker at heart. Like I love things that are fantastic and weird and, you know, and, and so I didn't have, I didn't, I never trained in anatomy. Like, you know, I'm going to train and learn anatomy. No, but I did a lot of it on the job. Like this oh, creature, okay. this creature required this. And that was like my training on the go. Okay, I gotta do this and I have to like study this while I'm doing this. You know, um, one thing that I do a lot that I don't know if anybody, anybody else does, I imagine they, they must do uh, do this, is that whenever I start a project and I have to tackle certain kind of, certain things I've never done before, I do a lot of research. Uh, for instance, when I did uh, Lady in the Water yes. for Spectral Motion, there's these uh, these creature designs that Crash McCurry designed called the Tartutix. And they're like, there are apes with tree like branches everywhere and they look kind of like trees. Yeah. Um, so I, I did, I spent about a week going through all kinds of uh, tree books, looking at all kinds of formations, textures, breeds, you know, all that kind of stuff. I went out, I went out, went out oh, to wow, the forest okay. and I kind of studied trees and kind of felt the way the, the, the lines and the, the shapes, the flow. Got all that in, got all that in my head, so that when I first started on the job, the first day when I sculpted my kit, you know, all my all my research came through in this, to the oh. point where somebody came up to me and just says, "Man, how is it that you can just come in here and sculpt trees that look like this?" And I said, 
Um, well, first of all, it's not magic. Uh, second of all, uh, I just did a whole week of research and, and study, yeah. and, and I hope you had done the same thing, young yeah. man. Because, <laughs> yeah, nobody's that great. You know, yeah. you, it's like you want to be great, you got to put in the work, you have to research, you have right. to practice. Yeah. Or, or, and that's a good way to word it, too. Because, I mean, what you do does come off as magic, uh, just like when you see a magician do something, you know, they're doing a trick. It's just, you know, the craft yeah. is so well. It's the and the amount of time that they spent perfecting that trick. Yes. Right. Yeah. No one sees that. And that's, and that's the part that people get confused at, you know, you know, for me, like the reason I didn't go through classic training, like, you know, there are, there are some sculptors in our business that are so good at the human anatomy, way better than, way better than I'll ever be. Uh, but that's, they spend most of their time just focusing on that aspect of, of work. Whereas for me, I feel like in some ways it's almost kind of unfair to me as an artist because, you know, I'm always trying to do something new, something different. And when you create something for the first time, yeah. you're doing it for the first time. And yeah. so there isn't any rules you follow. There isn't any like, you know, there's no, you know, same biceps and, you know, same deltoids and, and whatever sure. that, that you follow that you can do over and over again until you perfect it. It's always something new, but, because of that, it's a, it's a path that I cho that I, I choose willingly because I just want to keep exploring. You know, it's yeah. like my 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 first attempt at something is never going to be great, never going to be perfect. Maybe sometimes I'll get lucky; it'll look some, it'll look cool, yeah. whatever. <laughs> but you know, it's just one of those things where the constant exploration is what keeps me excited. And and knowing the caveat of well, I'm not doing the same things over and over again to perfect one thing, so I have to just be okay that sometimes it's going to look great and sometimes it's yeah. going to look bad. You know, that's just, the, yeah. that's just the rules of the of engagement. So yeah, it's the process. I, I mean, yeah. a great example of that is your work uh, on uh, underworld evolution uh, with Marcus. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody knows what a, a part bat part werewolf <laughs> yeah. looks like. And this came out so amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And, for, if you notice the anatomy on that, you know, I try to push it in different ways. So yeah. that it doesn't it doesn't just look like a healthy human being with mean, the angle of his rib cages, you know, and yes. and all the the skin right. stretching and how deep that you know his his uh, uh, abdominal muscles are. Like I try to create like a, a a slightly different kind of look just to make him look more otherworldly. Um, yeah, or like there, I gave it like that sunken like that bat rib look, and mm -hmm. yeah, because yeah, there's no reference for a a human human bat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There yeah, is, it's all it's all it's all exploration. It's all kind of like you know, what do you think this would be would look look like, you know? And then you just like you play around with my cats and you you find things that are interesting in nature, things interesting in in anatomy of like different aged people and different different motions and whatnot. You try to capture some of the the tension, you know. The tension isn't like like it's it's um like when something stretches and you see the veins and you see like yeah you know also like like that's all cool, but that but that's emotion that's kind of caught in time so sure. but it looks cool so i try to capture like some of those tensions try to put it into the sculpture so it's there permanently so they always oh, look like these tense little makes, things like that yeah yeah it, it, it tell, helps tell the story or um mm -hmm. i i thought this was amazing too uh with alien versus predator uh requiem the the sequel with, with, with the the predalien mm -hmm. uh, and even with this uh in the alien and predator franchises this has never been done before and yeah. I wanted to point this particular one out. Just the silhouette alone mm -hmm. uh, is selling it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's not just okay. Here's the design. Here's the paint job. Uh, that's just testament to just uh, I don't know, phenomenal work. You know. That yeah. Well, there. you know, H.R. Giger. He's probably had the biggest single influence of over our industry more than anyone else. You know. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And and so I've always been a huge fan of Giger since Alien, since back in the seventies, and uh, mm -hmm. so. So having the opportunity to come in and be, be part of the design team on that and uh, was just was great, you know. In fact, I, I really wanted to, I thought like ADI had done the last few Alien Predator movies and they did such a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. um, but the Alien went from very biomechanical to very organic over the years. And so yeah. when I came on, I, I had, uh, had a conversation with Alec Gillis and, and Tom Woodruff, the owner of ADI, yeah. and they said that uh, they had a meeting with studio and decided that the Predalien was going to be 90% alien, 10% predator. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Which eventually, which eventually changed a little bit. It, it, you know, the percentage kind of changed more in favor of Predator a little bit later on. Yeah. But that was the early genesis of it. So I got to do a design maquette for the Predalien. Uh, some of the stuff I did on the head stayed on the final, and then there was a bunch of other uh, amazing artists that had contributed to the head design. Okay. And, yeah. Here's and a the little. final, yeah, and the final head became kind of a no pun intended amalgamation of different art, different designs from different artists on the head. Uh, the body wow. was entirely my design. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, which was really fun because, you know, I, w I really love Giger and I wanted to pay tribute to Giger on that, you know. So so you can see a lot of the piping, a lot of that stuff came yeah. back very very distinctly. A lot of the tubes all came back and it wasn't super organic. It was all very kind of more biomechanical yeah. like in the original Giger painting. So well, it had a strong feel of that too. And, and you know, mm -hmm. not to mention, you know, the storytelling aspects they used it with. With the way it would uh, procreate, let's just <laughs> let's put it at that man. It was pretty hardcore. Yeah. Uh, very, and again, yeah, bringing that back. I know that that's the other thing is, uh, yeah, paying homage to that. I, I think you know fans really do respond to that well. Like for Giver, for example. I mean that like it feels like it popped right out of the manga. Uh, the way everything was set up, and that could have been a train wreck otherwise. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It could have been like some other. You know, saving time. It's it's true. It's it's in most situations a train wreck is just around the corner, and and if <laughs> something ever works, it's really a miracle, because you know because I think, I think you know in, in our I think in our existence in this universe, the, the the idea of chaos is just more it's more of a natural thing that would happen, than oh, yeah, yeah than the idea of pure synchronicity, you know. And the one yeah. thing I was I always teach my kids when they were young is that. It's easy to destroy, uh, to to, but not easy to construct. So you know you can spend five days building something beautifully. Be beautifully, it take you like two seconds to destroy it, because That's it's chaos. True. Yeah, chaos seems to reign in in our existence. So, so yeah, whenever you see something that works out, a perfect movie for you, a perfect design, a perfect whatever, it's a miracle. It really it's is, a, and, and appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> or even that it like gets put out or anything, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to pop a couple of things in here because I thought, uh, you know, uh, amazing pieces of work. And like I said, I, we could be here all day uh, and go over your so so prolific in, in what you Thank do. You. Um, so you were part of this Gremlins too, the new batch, mm -hmm. which, man, they pulled all the stops out of this. They've, you had like a, a bat one, a spider one, uh, and you got to work on this guy. Yeah, that's one. That one was it was great. That's uh, I got to design and build it. You know, and, Rick and just says the, uh, blocked out version. What you started yeah, with. yeah, I did about fifteen of those like that. Uh, each wow, one, really? each one took two days to do, um, and I don't know how many. I did about fifteen, and I finally got to the point where when I finally did the one you're seeing here, yeah, this was this was the very last one I did, and I asked, you know, I would ask Rick, like, what do you think? What do you think? And Rick be like, oh, keep going, keep going, do some more, whatever, because we had such a huge long schedule on that. Yeah. Uh, and finally, I just said, okay, look, I've done, I've spent a whole month doing all these different maquettes. I said, can you just pick one and I'll just start on it? Uh, and then if you want to make any changes, any comments, notes, whatever, uh, let me know. He says, okay. So then he picked that one. Yeah. And then I then I started sculpting him. I just kept sculpting him and Rick would walk by and I'm like, hey, Rick. He's like, oh, hi. And he will never like stop by and look at it. And so I finally like finished it, the whole thing. You know, I took it on set and we shot it. I never got a comment from him whether he liked it or not. I oh, just no, kept really? going. Yeah, <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't until that photo you that you just showed him on set in that control room scene. We shot yeah. that scene on set. Dailies came back. Then Rick came in all happy, like, oh, everybody loved it. Everybody loves Mohawk, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> so and at, at that point, I got my first confirmation that he liked it. And it was a year after I started. Wow. Wow, <laughs> yeah. really? And yeah. Then, yeah so, just to show you what it takes to make a, make a movie, guys. That's not even the entire crew. This was no. that's the that's the oh. R that's the R and D crew. We had wow. three months of research and development. You see on the right hand corner the big uh, gizmo head. Yeah. And behind it, directly behind it, is it's a, a life size gremlin suit. Yeah. I had I had, yeah. I had built that with uh, Jim McPherson. Wow. And uh, yeah, we had done all these different prototypes to test out a bunch of. Rick had shot a bunch of videos, utilizing green screen and puppetry and life size shrunken down, and we did all yeah. these crazy tests. Just to find out like what would work best, so that's just the crew for the R and D. Then once we got into the real, the real uh, meat of the of the work, we had over seventy people on the crew. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah, man, yeah. Like I said, they pull all the stops on on that, and and I mean it pays off too. I you know to see that at the end of the day, and um, 
you know, all, all the work that goes into it. And, uh, and there's, there's some other ones that even I was like, Oh man, I didn't know you were a part of this. Uh, and that is helping with the Batman Returns suit, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I sculpted, uh, Michael Keaton's suit and I sculpted the, uh, his stuntman, um, Dave Lee. Yeah. And this was the original head that I did. Uh, this oh, was this like a, yeah, this was the, this was the, um, what do you call it? The, the streamlined version of the 1989 Batman. Oh, you see it. Yeah. 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 And this, this one wasn't used on Keaton. Uh, the final one was the one Jose Fernandez did after I left okay. the show. Yeah, because they had they had done some experiments. They they had wanted me to make this the neck skinnier so he could move better. Yeah, that's a complaint. Yeah, he had on the first one, you know. Yeah, but 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 the reason why his neck is so thick is because it looks good. You yeah, know, it's, it's it's that aesthetics versus practicality. And uh, so anyway, so so I sculpted that version. It was kind of a test, and they tested it and realized that all the things that that they wanted to change should not have changed. So, but this is after I already left the show. So then Jose Fernandez came in and sculpted the final one that you saw in the movie. Uh, but the suit was the one, the suit, still the suit that I did. Yeah. It, it, it turned out amazing, though, the suit and everything. Um, and you Thank also, you. another Batman thing you're part of is uh, getting the, the bucket seats in here. Yeah, yeah. The 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 Batmobile on the on my, I guess on my right or the screen left. Yeah. Um, yeah I came in. Uh, uh, Tim Flattery had called me. He was one, he was a designer of the Batmobile. And uh, he said, hey, you know, you have a few days uh, free time, you know, you help us sculpt some stuff. And I thought, yeah, I came into the, the car shop and they said, yeah, we're doing the bucket seat. You want to sculpt that? I was like, okay. Yeah. And so I came in for a few days. I sculpted the bucket seat. And I left. And then I completely forgot about it until I don't know how many years later, I took my son, who was very young at the time, to a convention. And he goes, oh, look, it's a Batmobile here, you know, and <laughs> I was showing him the Batmobile and I peeked inside and I was like, hey. Yeah. I remember those seats. I completely forgot I had worked on that. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it just kind of flashes that memory back. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, I'm just gonna pop this up here. I know uh, you did this this one thing in it, but uh, I just want to show people just how involved you were in through the, these years of filmmaking. And there's another ultimate classic everybody loves, and that's Beetlejuice. Yeah, Beetlejuice. Yeah, don't say yeah. it again though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't say yeah three three times too much. Yeah. I know. This was uh, uh this was the one that I painted uh, for Ted Ray. Ted Ray did the stop motion animated sequence. Okay. For yes. that that scene, yeah, where, where he says, "I come for your daughter, Chuck." Yeah. Um <laughs> So this is the actual uh, scaled stop motion model. Um, and so I can't remember who sculpted the head. I know there were artists like Mike Smithson, uh, my my ex roommate, uh, late the late Matt Rose worked on it. Uh, okay. Maybe Tim Lawrence, maybe. Um, sculpted it. I came in, the sculptures were all done except for the teeth. So I sculpted the teeth on that. And then my job was to design uh, the paint job for the snake and then adapt the makeup into like uh, a, a stylized paint job on the face. So I actually painted this, the one you saw in the movie, and this is the, um, the one on the cover. Yeah. Man. Yeah. It, unbelievable. Again, it's it, it's all like it was on the, you're on the, every project you were getting involved here is on the, the pulse of, of, pop culture coming out of his time. I'm sure you didn't I, feel like I was it. very lucky. Yeah. 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 Cause when I was doing that, I was working two other jobs at the same time. Wow. Really? I was, I was working on Beetlejuice for Doug uh, Beswick as well. He was doing some stop motion stuff for, oh, for Beetlejuice. Okay. So I sculpted a, uh, I guess it must've been like a one, like one tenth scale Gina Davis head or something like that. A little tiny thing. Oh, okay. for that yeah i was doing that for him i was working on with screen mad george as well on a, a project called arena where we're built oh, building arena. A, yeah building yeah. that monster with him yeah and then and then i was doing my halloween contest uh part two halloween contest for screen mad george uh which i also won first place for later on yeah wow really so i was doing all those at the same time all at once no crazy. big deal no big deal uh yeah, I was a, I was a bit of a madman back then. You know, when yeah. you're young and full of energy, like who needs sleep? Yeah, yeah. Just what's didn't that? Need it. Yeah. You sleep later. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you got a chance to work with uh, Guillermo del Toro again, and mm -hmm. Blade Trinity, and and uh, with Dracula, uh, the beast, the beast form, I should say, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and the paint job again, just breathtaking work. And again, I mean, you guys can even look at it here, at every angle. This thing's amazing to look at. Yeah, this thing was originally designed by Carlos Huante. Mm -hmm. uh, he had done he had done a, uh, a silhouette of this, and the deep, but the, the body was very kind of uh, space looking. Oh, okay. And then and then Carlos had left, and the director really liked that design, but he felt like there was something kind of not 
didn't quite fit the film. Oh. And so he asked me to look at it and like, what did I thought? I thought, well, I think it's a cool design, but it needs to feel more, um, uh, more grounded to, you know, instead of being sci-fi, it should feel more Gothic. So ah, I, okay. so I, so I kept the basic silhouette that Carlos had done. And I and I end up uh, redesigning all the details and, and the body and all that stuff and the, the coloration. So it's kind of a collaboration between Carlos and I on that um, for the final creature. Yeah, and, you know, it seems like that for for uh, I mean, especially these days, like you said, there's the, the digital age where it's kind of killed a lot of the creature effects. Uh, you know, hands-on stuff. It seems like now it's just a perfect uh, to make the movie. It's a perfect combo of everything. You know, you're going to have an animatronic. You're going to have prosthetics. You're going to have digital. You're going to have. It seems like a lot of that has uh, a part to play. I mean, where do you see like um, the progression of this? You say we're at like an apex for like makeup and things like that. Um, where do you see like the future of, I guess, filmmaking with creatures specifically in mind? Um, it's hard to say, you know, because you know I'm always a proponent for marrying practical with digital. You know, and and I know there are challenges to to doing that. And some for some stuff is pretty, relatively easy, for others it's it's a bit harder to do. Um, you know, but depending on how much you're trying to replace and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so I don't really know. You know, I, I I feel like I feel like makeups should always remain makeups. You know, because. Yeah. Um, but then again, you know, you look at something like the Avengers, you know, where, where they did a digital makeup, you know, and I'm not going to say that it looked bad because it, it didn't. It actually was pretty right. amazing. So that kind of opened the door to well, where can it all go? So um, gotcha. okay. who knows? You know, all I know is technology stops for no one. This is a, if this this yeah. is one of the truths of our existence, that technology will never stop for anyone. Like uh, 3D printing is a good example. That's, mm -hmm. I see a lot of people doing making helmets and masks with that now. And yeah, I'm doing a lot of three D printing myself. You know. Yeah, you, um, of course you still sculpt digitally. You know, three D digitally, and then sure, it, sure, yeah. Well, I do both. You know, it, it just depends. Like I was just at a conversation the other day with with my my business partner uh, about you know if we if we had to do something quick and cheap uh, like a full creature armor or something like that. Okay. Um, like how fast can we do this? And so as an experiment, I was like, okay, I had a sculpture that I did in a day already uh, and I changed it up. Like, you know, in 15 minutes, I changed it up uh, into something oh. different. And then I sent it to my my digital uh, person and I said, hey, uh, cut this up and print it. I want to see the at, at this resolution, how many hours is going to take. So we printed oh. it all in, all in sections and then put it together. And then, uh, you know, it's not as tight as a, a hand sculpted thing. But it's pretty darn good still with the right amount of paint paint job good paint job on it you can disguise a lot of sins yeah, and that's a good way to word it <laughs> and so ultimately we figured okay uh, it, it takes about like you know okay about 150 hours to print this helmet at this size uh right. and we cut it in this many pieces so if we had let's say 10 printers you know or if we, we cut this thing in like you know six pieces then i need six printers all going at the same time wow, okay i could have the whole thing overnight you wow. know yeah, and so so they so it's it's a matter of like logistics. Like, okay, if I have ten printers at my disposal, I'm doing a quick That's job, numbers. and I'm I, I take this, I take me a day or two to sculpt all these things. Or if I had a team, we could sculpt everything in one day, send it to print, take one or two days to print it, take the actual piece, assemble the actual piece, you know, fiberglass behind it, reinforce it, and then paint the real thing, Man. and we'll be and we will full create a full armor suit in like a week, you That's know. That's crazy. So. So yeah, so if you're a studio that if you have the resources, you know, and you right. have the infra yeah. if you build the infrastructure, you can create miracles, you know. So so there's that side of it versus if you only have one printer, then you're screwed. You better yeah. just sculpt in clay because it'll be faster. So it's like that right. kind of trade-off. Yeah. There is that. I do yeah. want to bring that this up too. Uh so your Onyx Forge Studio. This is yep. like your main studio, but it's on the mm -hmm. bottom side. Um th I mean this is amazing. When did you uh for formula this together uh we formed the uh, january of 2019 last year wow so we're really yeah. interesting with that yeah yeah and you guys i imagine i mean not only do you have all the the, the resume to fit and the portfolio to fit mm -hmm. but all the contacts in the industry as well yeah. I, so you imagine you guys i mean until the pandemic hit were cranking things out left and right i mean how is the studio going Go, it's going good i mean it's primarily it was more of a a name change and a restructuring 
really is what it was. I yeah. got what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, because it's you know I have all the same clients and we're still we're still doing business with all the same people and, and a lot of new people as well. Uh, gotcha. But oh, okay. but yeah, so it's more of just a restructuring of the company. You know, some people left, some people joined. You know, kind of kind of a thing. Um, and then so we just changed the name and just re just start over again. Um, and so uh, it was good. It, this, especially last year, we we did better than we expected. Oh. Uh, and we got, and we're getting back into movies. For the longest time, I didn't really didn't, didn't want to do movies, you know, because I was a bit disenchanted with them. And okay. uh, and then so last year we ended up uh, doing Bill and Ted Face the Music. I was about to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, and then we did a, a movie called Thunder Force, which was oh. which is a, a Netflix movie that's coming out soon, that's uh, starring uh, Melissa McCarthy and Jason Bateman. Oh um, wow! Yeah, and so we so we made something for Jason Bateman uh, in the movie. Oh, cool. And um, yeah, and then Bill and Taylor were really excited to see that because you know that was I'm such super, a I'll, fun I'll project. This up. And, and and this I can we can at least talk about because it's on, on on all over the internet and stuff in, in trailers and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to the left uh, is, is the the poster, and then to the other side is the robot. I, can we talk a little bit about like the guy, or just uh, or at least uh, talk about uh, you know what it's like. You know your experience with this making. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think I can give away any story yeah, details. No, 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 yeah, anything like that. But uh, yeah, we were very fortunate. The way the way that I got the job was, uh, I got a call from Kevin Yeager. Kevin, he did all these amazing muscle suits and in the film, and he did a bunch of makeups, uh, some, some really good character makeups and stuff. Um, and so he and Bill Corso. Bill Corso is the head of the makeup department. So okay. they were uh, originally Kevin was supposed to do this robot for the film, but. Um, I think he got too tied up and was too busy, and so he couldn't do the robot. So, so he and oh, Bill okay. decided, you know, maybe let's call Steve, see if he he's available. So they called me up, and I, I went in and I met with the director, uh, uh, Dean Perso, who did the uh, you know uh, he did a Galaxy Quest, right, the masterpiece of oh, love it. the, the yeah. best Star Trek film never made. Yeah, Ex exactly. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so uh, yeah, so I went in there, and met with him. I was fanboying big time because I love Galaxy Quest. Yeah. Um, so I had a conversation with him, and then, uh, then I get then I get a call later, like, oh, they're also meeting with you know some other big effects companies that have the you know the wow. have the 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 credits, and most likely they're going to go with the bigger company. So I thought, well, hell, give me a shot, you know, and I, I, I know what I'm doing. So yeah. I called up Dean. I said, hey, Dean, give me a week. I'll come in with the design, uh, show you, and if you like it, give me the job. So. He waited before he made a decision. A week later, I went to go see him, and I showed him the design of, of the robot. And Dean loved it. And we talked about it, you know, and all the stuff, and he loved it. Uh, and he so he hired me on the spot. And oh, then, awesome. uh, wow. yeah, and then uh, then we went, and we went, we had six weeks to make this suit. Originally, we had 12, but then they couldn't find an actor. You know, there was, the casting is always, okay. it's always difficult, yeah, to find the right, the right guy. Um, so we waited and waited and waited. Finally, got really scary. And so we we did we did a little bit of what we could in the digital realm. Got that oh, stuff prepped and ready. Yeah. And then and then the rest was like, okay, once we get the actor, we just gotta fly. And then we got the actor six weeks before shoot, and we just worked around the clock and and did the best we could to get it finished. Yeah. So excited for that. I mean, and again, another amazing franchise. It can make a dozen more of those movies, and I, and I people love to watch that. Yeah, it was great. It was a great uh, atmosphere on set. It was everybody was so kind and friendly, and you know, it was like everybody's having one big party, you know. And, and it was, it was really cool, you know. And and meeting Keanu and, and Alex Winter, you know, and yeah, it was. It was That's great. unbelievable. I, I had yeah. I, I had someone on a show, uh, the Collier brothers, they're judo guys, and they helped him uh, train Keanu for the John Wick movies, and um, yeah, nothing but amazing things to say about the guy as well. The guys like yeah. Really cool dude. I, 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 I want to put my two cents in here. I think um, I'm not even going to ask uh, if there's going to be a third Guyver movie because I know you tried your damnedest with it. And I know there's a whole process. But all I got to say is we're in a day and age now where uh, or whoever the powers that be, at least for Guyver, we're in a day and age now where the TV, I think you mentioned a little earlier, TV is doing movie quality in many cases better because they can tell a whole 10 episode season mm -hmm. for a whole yeah. story and hands down guyver would be in a, a phenomenal choice for that character. yeah i i tried i tried to get this made uh, a few years ago and i i met with the i met the creator of the guyver and he gave me his blessing but i couldn't get past wow. 
That's big the uh, I can get past the the company that owned the rights uh, of it, oh, and we okay. went back and forth and back and forth, and uh, finally, after a couple of years of going back and forth, it it just became a situation where like they just won't make a decision. They literally, I had I had a company. <laughs> oh no, really? Yeah, I, I had a company that was the equivalent of a Disney uh, in Japan. Uh, back me up on this that wanted to work with me wow, really? that went to meet with them on my behalf and say we want to work with Steve We want we want to do this guy everything. Let's make it happen. And they still couldn't get it ha to happen wow. And I, and so I don't know what I don't know why it's so difficult because guy is still relatively uh, yeah, uh, obscure yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I yeah, I can't I can't figure out what the reason is other than it just wasn't meant to happen so so I, you know, I just kind of let it go because I, I was either I wanted to either make a, a feature film or I wanted to do like a maybe six to eight part Netflix, you know, oh, uh, series. Such a good idea. Because I have yeah. so many really cool ideas that I know the fans are just gonna shit their pants yeah, if they see I, it. Um, oh, and man. and I just had to just like okay, just gotta just close this chapter up and let it go. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, you know, I can't hold my breath anymore. I've spent years yeah trying to make it happen. It's not it's not me. It's just you know I can't get the rights. That ah, man, it's tough. I yeah, I always yeah. thought that for the longest time. Like, you didn't see anything with uh, like Transformers movies were blowing up all over the place, and I'm like, where's Voltron? Because they're doing like Smurfs and all the 80, mm -hmm. 80s cartoons and things in, in the movies. I'm like, where's where's this at? And it, it, it usually it goes back to something like that. Uh, was there a, maybe maybe you just answered the question? Was there ever um, a, a character, whether it's you or otherwise, was there a character you always wanted to see come to life that just hasn't yet? Um, I don't know. I think, I think that's part of my, that's a part of my brain. I shut off <laughs> because it just, it just, you know, when something gets so monumentally difficult, yeah, you just yeah. decide you know, do I want to spend my life chasing these things or do I want to chase something that's within arm's reach, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I, I'm, I always go for like things that could most likely happen, uh, because, Life's too short to waste on chasing, you know, things. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, but I will say though, I, I personally would love to make an Ultraman movie, like oh, an wow, updated, yeah. updated, you know, using all the latest effects, uh, and then just, you know, just another take on Ultraman and just a good, a good story, good characters, and that's a great and, call. And a, and a big budget kind of Ultraman movie. I, I mean, would if love you to look, do one. Even like you know, because you know, the size, literally the size, he's huge. Mm -hmm. monster. You look at um, you know Guillermo del Toro with Pacific Rim, and guy crushed it. I mean, mm -hmm. the best. And I and I love, believe me, I love Godzilla and, and you know Gamera and everything. But that was like the new age wise, this day mm -hmm. and age, the best kaiju movie that's been done. Yeah, uh, it's funny because uh, when I when I saw Guillermo. Uh, I got, I did get a call to work on Pacific Rim, uh, oh, wow. but I but I couldn't at the time because I was I think, I think I may have been producing my TV show at the time. Oh, uh, right. so so I ran into I, I want to say that's what the reason was because for some reason I couldn't work on it, and I ran into Guillermo at, at Monster Palooza, and oh. and Guillermo says Wang did, did did they call you to work on the Pacific Rim, and I said no to work on my film and I said. Uh, I said, yeah, they called me, but uh, I wasn't available. I was, I was too busy. I said, what's your film about? And he says, it's your movie, Wang. It's giant robots and monsters. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> oh and then no. um, and then when I watched the movie, oh, my God. I, ha I, had, I was just ear to ear, a smile. That oh, movie man. made me feel like a kid again, uh, especially yeah, when they yeah. got into the big monster fights and stuff. It was so well done and yeah. so dynamic. And, yeah, it was so good, so much fun. Even the and, the because the, the, he's really good with uh, attention to detail as well. Even the, subtle, the camera angle where you see like the the footprint in the on a street and how it would actually crumble mm -hmm. around it correctly. I, just little things like that just really sold that movie. Yeah, sure. it, it reminded me of when I was supposed to direct that Power Ranger movie back in 1994. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, going to that. Yeah, movie. yeah, I, I was supposed to direct that. I was hired by Fox, and I was on that project for about three months as a director, wow. and then uh, it just didn't work out. I had a lot of creative differences. With a producer and the the production itself wasn't functioning it was kind of uh dysfunctional and kind of broken and ultimately i just felt like i couldn't do anything and i thought what am i doing here i'm not this is not like a regular production you know 
Um, and so after we had my design team and I had designed all the robots, I had like 300 pages of storyboards wow. of the big hey. battle sequence of the giant robots and the monsters at the end, nice. which is, it was kind of bittersweet because I got to see these other movies like, like Pacific Rim and, yeah, you know, yeah. and all these, and God's, you know, even, even the 98 Godzilla, you know, yeah. and seeing that and just saying, wow, some of these shots are in my storyboards for my Power Rangers, you know, oh, wow. um, and just, you know, I felt a little heartbroken, like, you know, just thinking yeah. like what I could have been able to do, but they just didn't never happen. Um, but I would sure. someday love to do a, an Ultraman movie, uh, you know. Yeah, no, that'd be amazing. It'd be, yeah, it'd be, it'd be awesome, yeah. Yeah, and it's actually it's a good time for him. It's, it's right right for that time. Uh, there's another guy. It just uh, people are messaging in. Uh, how do you feel about the state of horror monster movies or lack of monsters today? Um, I think it's 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 a very old deep problem. Mm -hmm. Is that people are afraid to make monster movies, and and I say afraid because you know there was a time when monsters were all done. Uh, uh, traditionally, and so that okay. sometimes if you if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know how to shoot it, if you don't design the right look for it, you know, execute it, uh, it they tend to look cheesy and look bad, and that's a real fear of a film, and that's why there was there was a time after that where you saw less and less of the monster, you saw shadows, and you saw super tight close-ups of drools and teeth and. You know, it became like less and less, and they and they started telling you, oh, you know, less is more. Uh, when in fact, less a lot of times is just not enough. Um, yeah. And so, so you know, these are all things that sort of like compounded over the years. And then, and then when they went CG, all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, here I am. Look at me, I'm the monster. You know, because now it's something so yeah. different. And CG, you can see everything. Maybe you shouldn't, but you you do. Right. Um, and so, it's interesting seeing it all go full circle. But I think ultimately the fear of making a monster without losing credibility for your film or people taking it seriously, it, it's a very real, real fear and it's very challenging. And I think maybe that's that could partly contribute to the lack of monster movies you see these days, Interesting. you know? Yeah. Because it's a very hard thing to pull off correctly, is, is my point. It is, you, or, or to tie in with that, another movie that you, you were a part of, that another one of my all time favorites is Deep Star Six. Oh yeah! Oh, wow. And yeah. if you guys have not seen that movie, don't don't walk, run, and go watch. I think it's actually on the uh, Netflix or or Amazon Prime. Either way, you got there's access to this right now, and it is uh, one of my all time favorites. That even the paint job, but I, like you mentioned there, like <clears throat> yeah, this thing's got amazing design, amazing paintwork, but uh, for certain scenes, like it's very shaded and dark, and mm -hmm. you know, obviously sells you know, how scary it is. And then when you do get to see you know the creature better, it, it sells even more versus it's just you know with the lights on and you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one that one was a fun fun project. I mean, I wasn't on it for, for very long. I that was that creature was designed by Chris Wayless, okay. who's another another legend. Uh, I'm a big fan of Chris yeah. Wayless as well. He did Enemy Mine, which is one of my all time oh, favorite so, makeups so in film. So Chris designed that creature, and then Mark Schostrom was tasked to build the creature. So he called me in to do a paint job design for that creature. Wow. So, and then, so I came in, I designed a couple of paint jobs and then they picked one. And then I came in and I, and I, uh, Eddie Yang, who was my, my protege at the time, uh, okay. he was working for him. So I, I came in and I show Eddie how to paint it, uh, the, the first prototype. And then he stayed on with another crew and they painted all the creatures. So, wow. so my job primarily was more of a creature paint designer on that. that paint job. design. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. I imagine like, when, like, uh, back to like underworld, uh, evolution, when you have to do, uh, here, Williams. I mean, you 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 could probably look at this design. You have to go. Oh man, we're gonna do a lot of uh, a lot of like hair punching. <laughs> yeah, that suit that suit was all hand tied. Man, yeah. It was, again, very, super well done, and because he's in in the franchise, the ultimate werewolf. Really, I mean, he's the mm -hmm. original werewolf the original, and everything. Yeah. And it really uh, sold it well. But again, you know, it can't be easy. You know, with the animatronic on the head and the stilts. But uh, and Did you're you know? Still, go ahead. Did you know he was originally supposed to be 14 feet tall? Really? And run on all fours, yeah. Wow, yeah. really? That was they... the that was that was the original concept that Len Wiseman came up with. Man. And I even I even did a maquette of that on all fours. Uh, wow, of, really? Of, of basically that wolf, but on all fours, and it's a giant. So that people were like, you know, so when people faced him, they literally were standing up and it would face his head at, at the same height. 
Um, yeah. And then, but then I think I think they I think they decided that it was too expensive to do. So then he he came back down in size and became a, a bipedal creature instead. Interesting. That's a that's awesome. We, you know, again, I love the, the the footnotes on that. And uh, mm -hmm. they, they, I think maybe in the fourth one they kind of did something with a giant werewolf at one point. Yeah, the uh, the Uber Lycan. There, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I did work on that too. Um, oh, okay. Not the final one. The, the final, I Patrick Tatopoulos had done some designs for two of the lichens. There was the the sewer lichen, which was like so this kind of emaciated, uh, diseased. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had done some sketches for that that I sculpted the, the the my kit for it and painted for for CG reference so they can you know scan or rebuild or, or copy it. And then I did a, he had, Patrick designed the Uber Lycan, which is a giant. Uh, yeah. His his proportions was more like a gorilla or bulldog. But he had longer arms and shorter yeah. legs. So I had sculpted a, a, a maquette for that as well. Uh, super detailed, everything uh, for the digital department. But, and I painted it. And that was, that was like the, the, the end of that. And then when I saw the movie, they didn't really use that design. It's like what well, they ended up changing it, and it, it was kind of weird because they looked like a bear. It yeah, had this yeah, big nose. Around. Yeah, it was weird looking. It, it looked nothing like what I did, so I can't take credit for that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, actually, if you, you know, we mentioned this enough, enough times here, and I think it's actually a very important part of creature design is the the importance of the maquette. Mm -hmm. that, that I mean, it's, that's like every, it's like a, a storyboard for a scene. Whereas a maquette is to the final product, would you? How would you rate that? Is is like how important that is? Well, uh, yeah, it's very maquettes are great uh, if you use it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is that a lot of people will will do a maquette, and you you know you want my kit to capture the the feel of the of the character of the creature, right? So a lot of times people may not be uh, focusing on the technical aspects. For instance, if you're creating a, a monster that some a human being has to wear. What I've usually done in the past is I sculpted a human first that's proportional to a real person. Okay. And then you sculpt the creature my kid over it. So if you have head extensions, arm extensions, leg extensions, all that would be reflected realistically. So when you at the end of the day when you're done, it's like this is how we're what we're looking at the real guy looking like. That makes a lot of Whereas sense. Whereas a lot of times people will sculpt my kit and they won't think of that part. They'll just sculpt something that looks really cool. And the waist is way too small arms are yep. way too long and that you can't put it you know it's like all these things so it looks amazing and you sell it to production and they're like this is perfect then months later you get this comment like why doesn't that look like this yeah which which has happened before many times yeah I so imagine. it's so yeah it, it's kind of a slippery slope to to walk on you know you have to decide like okay how are you are you doing this to be realistic or are you doing this to sell something um you know choose wisely yeah yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it seems you know every time you see it, it's, it seems like such an important thing. I remember specifically when I first got on, uh, into that was like 2004 when they did Hellboy and the behind the scenes, and they came out with the book of everything. And uh, yeah, there's all everything was maquette uh, set up, so you get that. Feel. Well, it's funny because it, that you mentioned that like um, there's a story about how Doug Jones got hired on Hellboy. Oh, go um, ahead. Yeah, when, when I came in and I was painting the maquette. For, for the Hellboy, which Jose Fernandez had sculpted. He did this beautiful sculpture of, of Abe. And, uh, and you know, he's, he's, he was really long and really, really graceful and thin, but he was also muscular. And then so uh, I think a few weeks later, um, we all went to dinner with Guillermo to talk about creature stuff. And then Guillermo at dinner, he slipped me this picture of the, of the guy he hired to play Abe Sapien in England. He says, "Oh, Wang, this is who I'm gonna have play Abe." And I looked at him, and he looks like he's like five foot six or something, very oh. muscular. Yeah, yeah. And I look at it, and I said, "And then remember the maquette that I was working on?" And I said, "Guillermo, this is this is not gonna look what, the way you think it's gonna look." He says, "What do you mean?" I say, "Give me, I'll go home tonight and I'll Photoshop this guy into it, and I'll show you." Yeah. And so, so I showed it to him. I Photoshopped it. He literally was almost in tears. Oh, he just God. says. He just says to me, oh, my God, what have I done? And I said, I know who you need to call, Guillermo. I literally picked up my phone, <laughs> dialed Doug Jones, and I said, hey, wow. Doug, uh, this is Guillermo del Toro. Talk to him. And and literally the next day, Doug came into the office, met, really? with, met with myself, Guillermo, and uh, and, and uh, uh, Michael Azaldi, Spectral, 
and they hired him on the spot. And wow, and then yeah, because you know, because Doug had the body that my kid literally the first thing I said when I saw the my kid was this looks like Doug Jones. Yeah. But the person Guillermo hired was this short, much shorter, muscular yeah. guy that would never that look the same. Sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he looked more like a piranha than. A... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, but it's things like that, like the what you know, had, he had you had uh, worked with J Doug Jones uh, before that. Uh, Several times or just one time or several times. Several um, times. Yeah, I, I worked with Doug briefly on a film called um, This Present Darkness. It was never made. Okay. Uh, we spent about three, four months in the creature department. This was a company called Captive Audience, who was no longer around, headed up by Greg Cannon at the time. Okay. And uh, and there was all these different like it was like a, a very religious uh, based film of angels fighting demons, literally oh. classic angels with wings fighting demons with horns. And so I was brought on the project as a sculptor, Miles Tevis, um, the, the amazing Miles Tevis. Yeah. He was the designer, uh, the, the creature designer on the film. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And so one of the creatures that he had designed was a character called Lucius, which was played by Doug Jones. And he was a skinny blue color demon with these goat horns and a kind of an ape like face. So that was the first time I actually worked wow. with Doug. Yeah. And then a few years later, when I was doing the, another unmade film, or at least it was made, but didn't use my creature, was the Tooth Fairy that oh, I had tooth done. Fairy, yes. Yeah, this film called Darkness Falls. Uh, oh, I love that movie. Yeah, yeah, Doug was hired on that. I brought Doug in for that. And we built this whole suit, makeup around him. We even went on set for three months and never shot a thing, except for initial test. Um, as it turned out, it was because the director didn't want a, a monster in the movie. He, he thought that oh. the movie would look better without a monster. Uh, really? But... Yeah, to which I kind of said to him, I said, you, you and I read the same script, right? Yeah. This is about the Tooth Fairy. I would have and been there, pretty pissed if there was no monster at the end. Yeah, of the and there's no Tooth Well, the studio was pissed. He Apparently, he and the producers told the studio that the monster was so terrible they couldn't use it. Never once showing them what the monster that I built looked like. Are you like. kidding? Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, it was it was it was just an inside job. It was so yeah, a, if I remember correctly, your design, uh, it, it was like the mouth was kind of no jaw, but it was like yeah, it was a there was two there was two stages. When you, whenever you saw it, right, the, the whole idea of the, of the design was that when you saw it, you think you saw like an old Indian woman. She had long hair that covered up most of her face, very pale face. Yeah. It looked like she was wearing some kind of a robe covering her up, but in fact, the robe was actually her wings. She has six wings in in various sizes, wow. and instead of having bones that come out like a bat wing, they unfold it organically like leaves, and then wow. that's how she flew. Yeah. And then, so her face, the, the clear skin over her face was representative of the mask that she used to wear when she was alive because she had Gosh, a disfigured dude. face. That's right. So yeah. at the end of the film, when they're in the lighthouse and the guy finally turned the light on and it seared off the, her, her skin, then you saw the reveal face, which is that she really had no lower jaw. That's how she looked like before. Man. So those, that, was, that was my idea anyway in the design of what I thought the creature should look like. Yeah. Um, so we did. We built all the stuff, animatronic heads. I mean, everything. Yeah. And we went down, and we just never shot it. And the yeah. whole time, we were treated like clowns on set because, like, you know, oh yeah, here comes the guys that are getting paid to do nothing for making something terrible. Nobody, no one wants to shoot. Man, it was a horrible. Like, it was horrible. Absolutely yes, horrible. You know, yeah. like that's, that's the other interesting thing I, I've noticed with this show. Cause I, I've always, you know, loved all aspects of filmmaking. I'm a big movie buff, of course. Um, but you know, like stunt stunt performers very underrated uh as far as who gets attention you know awards and things like that uh same thing with uh special effects and um you know creature design and it's a very compared to like who are, who are the leading drama roles for the year you know what i mean like mm -hmm. it's all good but like it that needs to be um uh, given the credit where credits do more i i feel in, in uh the, the public's eye mm -hmm. and that's why i love you know having people like you on the show and doing anything i can to, to showcase that because you know i'm mean, just even stuff you know shit i'm looking at and i was just like dude you do this too this guy is my this is my childhood <laughs> as 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 many too but i was just like uh so i was uh, uh extra geeking out over that like i wanted to ask you like with guyver uh or, or guy dark hero specifically especially uh, being writer and director and like was there anything, any of the scenes on set that you're shooting just kind of really pops out to like, you know, like, wow, I, I can't believe like we pulled that one off. Um, 
you're talking about 25 years ago. <laughs> I know. Hard hitting questions here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure there was, you know, I, I'll be honest though, when you're making a movie like that, movies like that are really hard to do, you know, because when you have a guy in a superhero costume and a guy in a big rubber monster, it's really hard to not look at it and go, it's a big rubber monster, you know, you know, and, uh, and, you, and you're worried about whether it's going to be, it's going to look cheesy, um, which is, you know, it's a real worry. So a lot of times when you're shooting a movie like that, it, you, you tend to be more worried about how people are going to feel about it. Um, for me, it's always natural. I grew up with it as a kid. You know, I love big rubber monsters, but I know that a lot of people don't share that same sentiment that I have about it. You did a, so, really, you did a really good job though, Steve, like, like a really good job with it. Cause like something that really wouldn't normally you expect dialogue from, for example, uh, you know, like Rhino mm -hmm. uh, or even here, they're, they're yeah. fighting, you know, it's like, they're still able to really convey the, the, the acting they need to do very well. Yeah, actually. Okay. You just reminded me um, that scene with uh, crane when he's trying to convince Sean to join him in the cave. Yes. And, and then he, yeah, that, yeah, this scene where we, uh, this was the first day we worked with him in full animatronic doing uh, lip sync dialogue. Oh, oh. Yeah. And uh, uh, the mechanic uh, who did this, uh, Bud McGrew, he did the mechanics for it. He did an amazing job. And uh, and he puppeteered it live as the actor was performing. So I remember watching this scene as I'm shooting and going, oh, this is actually working. I think it's going to be, you know, oh, it's going to really? work well. Uh, in the same scene, I did a couple of experiments too. Like when he first came at the camera, you see his face change. Yeah. And then and that one worked okay. It was it was because remember there's no CG. This is all done. This is all done with uh, traditional optical printers. Uh, and then wow. the second shot where he comes back, he's in makeup, he comes back, and then he does one of these little head swipe and his clothes blows off and he's already changed to another thing. That was not CG, that was all shot in camera, you know, to match match motion. And I did yeah. literally a three-frame dissolve in post on film to, wow. to see if it worked. And it was like one of those things where I didn't find out if it works until like a month or two later uh, oh, after I shot yeah <laughs> so it's like things like that where you, you gotta take your chances and just go i think <laughs> it'll work i'll do my best to make it work and then when it finally worked i, I still show people that like look this is no cg and then they'll go holy crap you know it was you, seamless yeah you wouldn't know otherwise and by the way uh the idea to, to put him in the guy reunit especially a craft effect one was actually super super cool touch and i couldn't be the only one watching it going as soon as he put the, the guy reunit on just oh shit <laughs> <laughs> it's not to get real <laughs> yeah yeah uh but yeah that's amazing i love hearing that uh, those kind of stories on it and kind of you know yeah you don't know especially you know, yeah some things you want to be i guess right experimental and and mm -hmm. try. it seems like that a lot too i i'm not sure if it's the artist side of you or just um or geeking out over it too like just I, I want to bring something to the table something new to the table right is that something you'd say anytime you approach a project Try yeah, to do. try to. Yeah. In fact, in fact, my mantra at the time, whenever I, I, I was trying to make a film was I always think about, OK, what do I want to see in the trailer? I need some I need some money shots, you know. Yeah. And and so for the guy, like there was like the flying transformation when he jumps off the cliff and he does that whole wow, thing. That like, so good. Yeah. That when I was when I was writing that scene uh, and envisioning and storyboarding it, I had no idea how we were going to do that. You know, we didn't we didn't have the technology yet. Like, you know, that was actually a compilation of live action elements, green screen and CG uh, all mixed together. But back then I had the only guy I had to do CG for me had just started learning CG. And oh. some of his and some of his early tests were not very promising. Uh, this guy named John Tesca, who's like amazing now. Yeah. And and so, you know, he was like a friend of, of he was a friend of a friend. Um, Oh, I so see. yeah, and so in the time that I he showed me the first test, and I was kind of like, oh, I'm really worried about this. Uh, he had gone to a place called Foundation Imaging, where they were doing all the effects for Babylon Five. Wow! And then in the six months that we we didn't talk because I was busy making the film, uh, he came back super knowledgeable all of a sudden and knows all this stuff. And then so <laughs> when I finally I just shot the I just shot the movie according to plan. Like we we did this, oh, like okay. yeah, like in that in that. Uh, flying transformation shot when you first see him like flying up in the air, right? That was actually a green screen of of, of David Hayter. Oh, okay. Uh, shot in green screen, animated, and then the the cliff itself was a miniature. 
Really? Yeah, it was a miniature, and I actually had shot the move, and it came back on a dolly track, and then we did, we, we tried to get a white, like a blur in the shot. And then I shot the rest, which was actually done like a month or two earlier uh, on location of, of my actors in the, the Guyver suit, and we had the big camera, and we had rigged these little air hoses to shoot <laughs> up smoke and coordinate everything so that he jumps down at the right frame in the right moment, does his performance, he runs off camera. A second actor in a Guyver suit, twenty feet down, will continue the run. So it looked like he really flew <laughs> off fast. And we timed That's everything amazing. out. Yes, and then the and all the cords. This was all animated. It's all CG. Oh yeah, so, the suits coming on. Yeah, yeah. Until he landed. So all these elements, I gave him all this footage and go, here's the elements. And he then when he brought, came back with the shot, I was like, <laughs> oh my god. We pulled it off because like, you you just had like pieces. You know, he, yeah, I shot all the elements and I gave it to him. And I gave wow. him my storyboard. We talked about timing. We talked about everything, and he just went off and he did it. He came back, and it was beautiful. You know. Oh, super! Yeah, super well yeah. done. Like like all the blades, you know, was all CG. Like wow. we've never done that before. So good. Yeah, that was just fun to be able to see. Um, one shot that was so good was in the scene where in the in the forest early in the film where he was running towards Volker. Yeah, uh, and he you just see David Hayter running sideways, and right before he disappears behind a tree, you see the lights flash, and these yeah. and all his power cords came out yeah. around him, and he disappears. If you frame by frame that, people people thought that was practical because it looks so real, and it, it was did. that was yeah. actually CG. Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah. Man. So yeah, so John saved the day. He, I was so nervous. <laughs> he went and away, came back with some. Came back some and he yeah. he knew his shit. Yeah, and so I was really happy that happened. Man, it's 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 unbelievable. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, well, whenever uh, fingers crossed, whenever I don't know, like it, I don't know. Let's say, okay, you tried so hard to get Guyver three made, for example. It sounds like this the story is phenomenal. I, I'm I'm excited for it. Uh, I don't know. Is there another medium you could do like um? comic or a cartoon or um no i just don't have the rights in, in general, so it, it, rights. it just can't be guyver yeah it's too bad because the finale the, the finale uh i introduce uh, a whole new power that's oh, man. pretty badass yeah we'll leave you guys hanging with that one uh yeah. I, before we wrap up here I, I, I really again appreciate your time this has been amazing um you uh, i want to let everybody know just how you know a part of pop culture he was. You did some sculpt work for Evil Dead too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a huge, a phenomenal franchise. Uh, what exactly did uh, they have you do? Um, I was working for Doug Beswick, and I sculpted the stop motion model of the Linda corpse. You know that scene where Bruce Willis? I mean, uh, uh, help me out here, Bruce um, Campbell. Campbell, sorry, yeah. it's been been a while. He was peering out the window, and then his dead girlfriend comes up oh, from man. the ground, and yeah. her head is severed, and yeah. she starts to do this ballet dance with her head rolling on her shoulders. It was so messed up. <laughs> yeah, I sculpted that stop motion model. Wow, uh, really? Yeah, and and for Doug Beswick, we animated that scene. Yeah. Well, it's it's such a, a memorable moment. And the second you said yeah. the, that whole wow. movie is insanity. It was such a great film. Yeah. <laughs> totally, totally. Again, yeah. well, they want to turn that into a uh, a, a TV. Uh, franchise for i think three seasons mm -hmm. uh yeah tv is just as good as ever has been uh so while wrapping up i want to put this up for everybody uh it's a nice screen full of information for everybody here uh, this, this is all places you can find steve wang um definitely if you haven't checked out his imdb page uh, go check it out now <laughs> chances are you you're a fan of most of the things on there you've seen them uh but he also uh onyxforge.com uh, elitecreature.com He's on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all, all the social medias here. And especially if you're a collector, definitely check out EliteCreature.com. There's a, tons of amazing work on there. I, I, I didn't, I, again, I can't we, – we spent like two hours talking about just badass shit, and I, <laughs> I, there's still so much more to go. But I, uh, it, we would love to have you back on the show in the future. In, yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Uh, it would be amazing. Other than that, guys, thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Steve Wang, for joining us. And until the next one. Yep. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hope you all enjoyed the show. For more great interviews and content, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Legends and Master Show. Also, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Be sure to go to our website, www.legendsandmastershow.com, and join our email list for all upcoming shows, events, and articles. 
see you on the next one.